So, schönen guten Vormittag. Good morning to all of you here at the conference stage of Ars Electronica 2017. It's actually the third time that we have this uh, wonderful but also very challenging opportunity to use the premises of the Post City, as we named it. Actually, the building that we are here is, uh, has been the former logistics center of the Austrian Postal Services. So for almost 20 years, in this building, thousands of letters and packages arrived every morning and they were sorted out and distributed and then driven away by lorries, by train and uh, also of course by postmen themselves on their bicycles. So it used to be the center where information and goods have been distributed, coming in, coming out. So it's quite symbolically that in the age of uh, digital technologies, digital media, big data, and of course uh, the future of artificial intelligence, we do our festival, these gatherings, these conferences here in this space. And it's always very difficult to be on stage here because you have to behave like one of these parcels on conveyor belts, always looking in different directions. But we thought the space is so nice here. Why should we just make a frontal stage when we can make this uh, very nice uh, circle? I apologize to the speakers uh, and uh, it's always sometimes you, most of the time you look into the back of people, but for everybody who will join the stage, you know, that's the way how you should talk to people. And it's re really inspiring because the more you circle, <laughs> so well, that's, uh, I hope you have enough time I hope all of you will stay several days here in Linz at the Post City, at the Ars Electronica. This is, as you might know, just one of the 12 venues of this year's festival. We have a total of 1,050 artists, lecturers, scientists, presenters who are coming for these five days physically here as people to present their works and their ideas to you. It's quite a big thing, but uh, you will see we did our best to organize it in a quite clear uh, uh, um, areas and sectors uh, concerning content, concerning formats of the festival as well. A very important part, of course, of every Ars Electronica is the main symposium, the theme symposium. You all have seen uh, artificial intelligence, the other eye, this is the topic of this year. And as the subtitle clearly indicates, this will not be a usual science engineering conference about artificial intelligence, uh, where we talk about all the different types of softwares and how the things are being done. We are really focusing totally on the ethical, societal, the cultural dimension of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the big hype in these days, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to use this hype also as a mirror to reflect and to look at our relationship with technology. Especially when it comes to these discussions now in the public about artificial intelligence, very often we hear the people talk about the danger of that technology. We talk about it as if it would be something completely external, something that is has been dropping down from sky, maybe some aliens flying with a UFO and dropping down this technology to punish us. But of course, that's totally stupid. That's just the way how we always like to do it, you know. Put the responsibility away. It's not me who is responsible to live. It's the technology. But of course, we know there is not a single piece of technology on this planet that has not been dreamt of, conceived, realized and applied by us, by human beings. So if we are afraid of anything when we think about artificial intelligence, actually the only thing we are afraid of is us, ourselves. We are afraid of what we might be able to do with all this technology. So we think it's extremely important at this moment not to be super afraid what the problems could be in 100 years maybe, when this technology, maybe when these computers are more powerful, more intelligent than us. But what can we do the next 10 to 20 years to shape the direction of this development in a way that we actively contribute to avoid these negative scenarios? 
And at the end, it's all about our responsibility. This is what the festival is about, this is what this conference is about. And we are very happy and very proud to have really many very distinguished experts here as speakers today. And before I spend all the time, I hand over to the protagonists of today. And first of all, I would like to introduce Martina Mara. We are very proud that Martina Mara is working in Ars Electronica Future Lab since many years. She is one of the first, or maybe even the first, robot psychologist, uh, at least the first one I ever knew, I ever heard about it. And it's not just a fancy title. She seriously made all her studies and her education to cover both of these areas. And she will guide us, or will guide you, through this morning session. And without any further ado, Martina, thank you very much for taking over this challenge to moderate the museum. Thank you, and have a nice morning session. Thank you, Gerfried, for this nice introduction. There has been a robo-psychologist in Isaac Asimov's um, stories already, I have to admit. Um, as Gerfried mentioned already, I think, or I'm pretty sure that there's no other topic in current times um, that both fascinates and frightens people as much as it is the case with artificial intelligence. Um, I'm very happy that we're going to have the great opportunity to listen to 11 really great speakers today who will open up all kinds of different perspectives on artificial intelligence, not from the alien perspective, but um, with a very internal approach and very practice-based approach. We will hear about potential risks and benefits of artificial intelligence. We will hear about ethics, about technological foundations, about creativity, about learning, and of course, a lot about humankind. Which means, coming back to the tradition of Ars Electronica, we're going to have 11 speakers who talk about technology, society, and art. Um, we're going to start right now with the first session of today, which is called Reality and Expectations. And I want to warmly welcome Robert Trappel to the stage and introduce him, please. Robert Trappel. And I'm so happy that he is with us today. He's the head, the head of the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence. He's also a research partner in the, you all know it, very important European Human Brain Project. He has all kinds of academic backgrounds. It's amazing. <laughs> he, has, he has studied electrical engineering, he has studied psychology, sociology, astronomy, and even management. He's a professor of medical cybernetics and artificial intelligence at the University of Vienna. He has published and co-edited 180 papers and more than 30 books. And as far as I know, he also likes to perform contemporary dance, sometimes even on stage. So, Robert Trappel, whatever means you choose to introduce us to the past, present and future of AI today, the stage is yours for the next 25 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Yeah, thank you very much for your welcome. Um, really, as Martina just said, uh, artificial intelligence uh, at present is the total hype. I'm just coming uh, from the International Dance Weeks, where they invited me to give a workshop on artificial intelligence dance. So, unfortunately, I can't show you what I did there because we don't have time enough, but maybe at a later moment. So, I skipped all slides because I have only 25, means now 24 minutes, um, to give a short introduction into AI, past, present, future. You may want to hear first what 
is AI, what are definitions of AI, and maybe you will hear 20 more of them today, so I bring the two I like most. Um, definition one, to make computers smart. Definition two, to develop models of our psyche, our psyche, and that means for now of our brain to get a better understanding of ourselves. So these two definitions are the ones I like most. Short story of AI, I don't know if you know all of it. In 1956, um, an American mathematician, John McCarthy, had the idea to bring people together who did not only want to number crunch uh, with computers, but also to process concepts. And to get money for that, he had to invent an interesting title, and the title was Artificial Intelligence. Still interesting for us. And at the conference, there came where it was in 1956 at the Dartmouth College, there came quite a lot of people who presented works which were not only number crunching. And the, the most interesting was some of the guys had developed a program which played a game and he himself couldn't beat the program. Up to then, everybody thought a program can only be as smart as the programmer is. And suddenly, he couldn't win against it. What was the trick? He used this program to play with people who were better than he was. And this program could learn excellent methods, which at that time people thought, that is AI. And it turned out, excellent methods. But five years, ten years later, we had other methods, who were all, which were also excellent methods. So now, Please don't identify AI with deep learning. Deep learning is an excellent method, but not identical with AI. It's one important method of AI. We have several others which we still use for other problems and which we will use. So this is just... Um, um, for, because I read it so often, it's, I think, important to distinguish that. So the methods developed after 1956 were, for example, knowledge representation, reasoning, language methods, and many others, which are still in use. Then, and with these methods, in 1997, uh, the world champion, world master of chess lost against the program. And people were surprised, is that possible? But other people who read the literature, the publications, knew that was predictable, because if you have a game which you have many options to make the next draw, you will find out that you get a combinatorial explosion of all possibilities. But the faster the computers are, the larger the memories, you can predict how many years will it take that you can calculate all possibilities. So it was predicted in the early 90s it would take probably until the year 2000 
that the world best chess player would lose. It was a little bit earlier, three years, computer developed faster, but it was predictable. Now let's move to the present. What happened last year? The big surprise. It was possible that the best Go player, the world champion, lost against the computer program. And that really was a movement, a shock to the scientific community plus the best Go players. And uh, why? It was unpredictable. We guessed 10 years, 20 years. It's so complex. You can't do that. It's impossible to model that. And it was a different strategy. Naturally, this strategy didn't come out of nothing. Already in the 80s, people simulated nerve cells. Well, actually, any uh, similarity between these artificial cells and real nerve cells is just happens. It's, it's like a disclaimer in the movie to say, uh, there is no practically no similarity. Nerve cells work totally different. We are now capable to model very simple um, properties of nerve cells in spiking neurons, but these artificial neurons don't spike. It is also not necessary that they spike, but there are no similarities or hardly any with neurons which you have, which I have, which most animals have. So the idea which is behind that, which in the, in the 1980s people said, ah, this is the way humans are thinking for retina. So there are similarities to how we humans work. Um, now, and you know, uh, the man, one of the men who worked in that area was Geoffrey Hinton. Uh, Geoffrey Hinton, now with his group, moved to Google. The guy and his group who developed AlphaGo, the program which, was, which played Go better than Lee Sidor, uh, that group under heading of Demis Hassabis was in the meantime bought by Google. And I have to add, we also were just work uh, in our research institute in a project with Google because it's a fascinating company. But I suppose we won't be bought by with around $500 million by Google, and we love to, to remain in Vienna and enjoy life and don't get directions from far away. Uh, one of the interesting methods which uh, Demis Hassabis is using is reinforcement learning. You may know it's about uh, 100 years ago that Soren Dyke uh, trained rats to press a lever and to find food. So the idea which you could apply to deep learning structures is uh, to make them learn by getting reinforcements when they have, when they approach the right solution. Um, I have, can only refer to a presentation on Monday where you will hear by, um, I think, about one or one and a half hour a description of the functioning of deep learning. Uh, unfortunately, time does not permit to do that now. 
Um, I have 23 minutes, uh, 25 minutes all together, and that means I have to come to a summary. And that, that is future. We have past, present, future for that 25 minutes, and Martina will give me a sign. Ten. Ah, great. Okay. Slow down. <laughs> so, how will the future look like? The future in nine minutes. Um, well, one of the important developments we have now is deep learning. So, research will continue in deep learning, and there are already developments which show into which directions that could go. It's competitive learning, it's called adversarial learning um, networks, and uh, it's, that's the interesting, it's unsupervised compared to the present method. Details on Monday. Um, I think Another very important topic, and I won't discuss here self-driving cars, we all agree, they will come, we don't know when, and they are really an important thing. The one, um, an aspect which very few people think about is emotions. Emotions will become very important for AI. Psychological research already in the mid-90s of the last century showed that if you have people who have little, few, small or no emotions at all, they make worse rational decisions than those with emotions. And that was a surprise because one thought the rational subject, at least in economy, you heard about you have to make rational decisions, no emotions. That's wrong. Emotionality and rationality are not opposite. They are, uh, they are, a, an excellent combination. They support each other. Therefore, we have to study more about emotions. We have made an artificial intelligence since 1956 without emotions. We have intelligence, but emotions was missing. So I think this will be a very important topic, um, especially important if we consider another area, which I think will become more and more important. It's my personal view, and ask me in 10 years when, when I was wrong in which aspects, I'm sure I will be wrong in some of them, and that is personality models. If we want to interact with programs, especially with robots, they have to have some kind of personality. Um, I should, would love to de explain to you a simple personality model like belief, desires, intentions model. Um, consisting of beliefs, that's an idea. Um, you have beliefs about the world. You know, or oh, you believe, that you are sitting here and that you're hearing some guy who, um, who tells you some stories of which 90% may be wrong, but hopefully it's interesting. But um, you believe it. We have no certainty. And the same holds for computers or for robots. And 
we have desires to make us a real person, a person which we can interact with. We have to have motivation, drives, needs, etc. And in that respect, we have to model desires, we have to model emotions. And when both come together, then we make plans, we reason, we have intentions, how to really bring them into effect. So we have beliefs, desires, intentions, BDI models are one of the interesting, there are several personality models. And I think with emotions, together with emotions, we will have to develop them further. Now, robots will, be, will have to be developed. If you look, if you compare what is the success of computer, of AI programs, compared to robots, we have AI programs who beat the best Go player. I am still waiting for a robot who competes in a skiing tournament, Reason to a Love, or something like that. Have you ever seen a robot there? The, the, the problem is that not even on the Idiotenhügel you find robots who try to ski. There are a few attempts, but robots are far behind. However, if you find time, look at uh, the most recent development of Boston Dynamics, the handle robot. Um, developed and presented this year, you find an impressive YouTube video and you will say, oh, that sounds quite interesting. That, that has a chance of solution. When we have robots at the workplace or as partners, we want to have them a personality. Future is difficult to predict. Four years ago, I edited a book with the uh, title Your Virtual Butler, The Making of. I would have liked to use it, Your Cybernetic Butler, but the publisher said, that's already a title registered, you can't use it. And we discussed how should these uh, robots B who interact with people in the long run, especially with people with uh, special needs. In the meantime, if you look at the development of exoskeletons, so structures which are outside persons, and give them flexibility, more power, Maybe that people won't want robots which help them, but maybe they prefer exoskeletons which make it possible for them to move around. So to make predictions or to guess how developments will be, that's absolutely difficult. There is a book um, written about love and sex with robots, uh, you may have heard about it. The author is David Levi, and he says that uh, probably not long ago, uh, people will marry uh, robots. So I looked at the Austrian marriage law, and it doesn't say it's forbidden to marry a robot. However, there's one limit, namely, each partner has to be at least 16 years old. Would you like to marry a 16-year-old robot? So I do think <laughs> this is quite unlikely. 
And I could I have a whole list um, of probable impacts of AI and even in 1986 I um, published the book Impacts of Artificial Intelligence. It's really fun to read now. I can recommend it. Uh, and if you want, I can send. I have a few copies left which I can send to you. Um, the, the pre we agree AI is a disruptive technology. We know AI will change society, will change our lives. Will it be a threat? I don't know. I find interesting in that respect a book which was uh, written by a Japanese robot designer who is an expert in Buddhism. It's uh, Masahiro Mori. I apologize for wrong pronunciations. I'm sure I did it wrong. Um, him, you may know him because he defined the uncanny valley. And this book reads the Buddha in the robot. So I think this is an idea how to approach the problem. Robots, AI is not our enemy. If we cooperate, with them, it can be for the great benefit of us and for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, what I forgot to mention is we have two great simultaneous interpreters. Um, yeah, <laughs> applause for them. <laughs> Are you translating English into German? And back. Okay, um, if you need a translation system, you can pick it up at the entrance of the conference hall. All right, so I'm sure that there are lots of questions to Robert Trappe concerning either his talk or his dance. Please remember them, because um, before we're going to start with a Q&A session, we're going to listen to our next speaker, who is Joanna Silinska. She is a professor of new media and communications at Goldsmith University of London. She works as an artist, as a curator, and very interestingly, she has also translated Stanislav Lem's philosophical writings, right? She's the author of five highly inspiring books, such as Minimal Ethics of the Anthropocene. And in general, I heard that she likes to explore the end of man in all its tragic comical aspects. Today, she's going to talk about the man 2.0 and the returning of Robocop and Terminator. Please welcome Joanna Zielinska. Thank you to the whole team at Ars Electronica for having me here and for uh, all the organizational matters in making my trip happen. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let me start with a little bit of background. My interest in uh, robots, cyborgs, and sorry, can I check if the slides are on? The slides are on the screen? No. Uh, can I have the slides on the screen now? Okay. Good. Yeah. No. So 
I, I want this. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. So I'm going to time myself. 25 minutes. So. Let me start with a little bit of background. My interest in robots, cyborgs, and other humanoid manifestations of artificial intelligence goes back more than 20 years, when I was finishing my PhD and starting to produce my first publications. Cybernetics, robotics, and AI opened up for me the possibility of going beyond the religiously inflected assumptions about the human and of recognizing that we have always been technical beings, that we came into being via and with technology, via fire, flint stones used as both tools and weapons. But I was also interested in the feminist take um, on the cyborg and robot in the critique of the military-industrial complex by the likes of Donna Haraway, and also in the need to understand the embodiment of technology beyond data streams. But the current purchase of machines that can both enslave and liberate us and whose intelligence can compete with or even exceed ours seems to have diminished in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So in my teaching, I often pose a question to my students. Uh, is the cyborg still a useful concept, or has it become obsolete? And for a while, they've been saying, no, it's a bit dated, it's a bit 80s, it's a bit gauche. When obviously scientists and engineers were still tinkering in their labs, or the cyborg as other, a figure of both immense promise and immense threat slowly retreated from public imagination. Now, part three of Terminator series even performed a symbolic annihilation of the masculine cyborgian figure, with melancholy beaten down Arnold replaced by TX, a smart gynoid terminatrix. So we can therefore suggest that 2003 announced the death of the masculine cyborg as a host for AI, opening up towards more collaborative bottom-up models of human non-human intelligence and artificial life. Dolly the Sheep, Cellular Automata, Neural Networks. But now, 15 years later, as the, the cyborg as the human's other, framed by renewed interest in artificial intelligence, uh, has returned. And of course, artificial intelligence doesn't just come in the shape of robots, androids, cyborgs. But I'm interested uh, in the packaging of that narrative and that research uh, in the language of media and in certain cultural icons that come to haunt us. So I'm aware of, and I'm not sure that a lot of speakers uh, today will be speaking about different incarnations, more complex, more interesting perhaps. But for me, that particular visuality is, is, is what's at stake. As a media scholar, I'm also interested in the cultural connotations of this return. Why are we hearing so much about robots, cyborgs, and AI again? Why now? What kinds of promises and threats are being made in AI's name? Is AI our enemy, our savior, our kin? Or is it part of us? The other ride, as andere ich, as the title of this edition of Ars Electronica playfully suggests. What models of the human are the developments in AI and the stories told about those developments bringing in? And what is being made hidden or obsolete in the process? So by way of tackling these questions, I want to make a proposition. The present return of the cyborg, the robot, the android, that is a renewed interest in artificial intelligence on the part of Silicon Valley researchers and investors, and a packaging of this interest in humanoid shapes by and for the media, is a response, although not necessarily a direct or even acknowledged one, to a number of planetary scale issues, such as climate change, the depletion of the Earth's resources, and the accelerated extinction of various species. In other words, I'm proposing to connect the promises made by artificial intelligence researchers with the dominant crisis narrative of our time, the Anthropocene. Posited as a new geological epoch in which human influence upon the geo and biosphere has been irreversible, as evident in phenomena such as extensive agriculture, industrialization, and population growth, the Anthropocene has become a new epistemological filter through which we humans see ourselves. But I'm also proposing the term to see AI as the Anthropocene imperative, a demand to respond to a situation a call to responsibility, 
issue to all of us humans. Now, before I proceed further with my analysis, I want to show you my critical take on the present return of the cyborg in a slightly different medium. I've made a kind of six-minute photo film tight Exit Man, and it raises questions about the remodeling of the human in the Anthropocene era in a top-down way promoted by the tech industry. But it also considers the possibility of envisaging the other eye, which is always part of me. So it's more like mycelium than like a robot. I'm going to show you the first part of the film now. Could we have the sound, please? The belief in seemingly interminable growth has led to depletion, scarcity, and the crisis of biological and social life. Maybe this quiet apocalyptic this. state of events has been called the Anthropocene. Stretching back at least 250 years to the early days of fossil fuel excavation okay. and burning, the, the Anthropocene sorry. can't be seen and hence known by us contemporary humans. Sorry about that. It always happens at tech events, doesn't it? I teach new media and it's always, uh, yeah. Maybe a bit louder, please, sorry. The belief in seemingly interminable growth has led to depletion, scarcity, and the crisis of biological and social life. This apocalyptic state of events has been called the Anthropocene. Stretching back at least 250 years to the early days of fossil fuel excavation and burning, the Anthropocene can't be seen and hence known by us contemporary humans because of the vastness of time across which it has unfolded. It can only be visualized, singularly yet repeatedly. Such visualizations usually draw on apocalyptic tropes straight from the Book of Revelation. Images of the blackening of the sun, of heaven falling onto the earth, of lands being moved out of their places. Yet they only show us what we are capable of seeing while hiding the most dramatic message of the Anthropocene, the end of man and everything else. No picture can convey the fact that soon there will be nothing to see and no one to see it. Current Anthropocene visuality ultimately has a mollifying effect. We are thus slowly being appeased into accepting the status quo about the condition of our planet. We are also being persuaded that salvation from the Anthropocene's finalism will soon arrive from a godlike elsewhere. It will either take the form of an escape to heavens in the form of planetary relocation, or it will happen via an actual upgrade of humans to the status of gods. In both of these Silicon Valley fueled prophecies, Man arrives in the technological New Jerusalem, fully redeemed and redesigned. In the humanist imperialism of the Anthropocene era, man has thus succeeded in elevating himself above the complex planetary processes to reclaim a divine position, that of the maker and destroyer of worlds. But he achieves his godlike status at the cost of sacrificing sexual and biological difference, disavowing his kinship with women and those of non-binary gender, with animals, fungi and microbes, the man of the neo-apocalypse emerges standing, proudly erect. This disavowal of cross-gender and cross-species kinship is a condition for the preservation of man's self-belief and self-appointed authority 
allowing him continued dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Should we therefore panic about the end of man, or should we rather welcome it, and maybe question what it is that is actually ending? Shouldn't we rather try and chip away at the apocalyptic habit that is also the foundation of man's fictitious authority? Is it not time to reclaim and rewrite the prophecy about the end of man? One way to start may be by challenging the widespread belief that salvation from the current planetary apocalypse will come from another place. Such outsider solutions are not just being proposed by high-tech entrepreneurs on their celestial missions. They are also part of our current political landscape, with its procession of strongmen that are promising us earthly redemption and perpetual abundance. Okay, so that's it for now. And let me return to the slides. Okay. Um, is everyone seeing the slides now? No. Could we see the slides, please? The guys at the back are waving at each other, so something's happening. Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, so the present anxiety about the condition of our planet and the extinction of the human species manifests itself in the panic about the scarcity of resources available to sustain humanity, in concerns over the aging of populations, in renewed interest in artificial intelligence on the part of Silicon Valley, and in biotechnology research into ways of upgrading the human all the way to immortality. But in accusing the human of being the cause of all these planetary disasters, the Anthropocene narrative actually aggrandizes the human by reinstating the supposedly sexless yet very gendered man to the center of action. Tom Cohen and Claire Colbrook point out that the narrative of humans as a distractive species hasn't only generated the imperative to survive. If we discover ourselves to be an agent of destruction, then we must reform, regroup, and live on. It's also produced what they have termed a hyperhumanism, which I would like to rename here Project Man 2.0. Project Man 2.0 entails a secular mobilization of religious imagery, with singular man now rebranded as Homo Deus, or the God species. The term Homo Deus has been used by journalist Mark Linus in his popular science book. A lapsed environmentalist who spent years destroying genetically modified crops, Linus eventually saw the light. He realized not only that the Green Movement was not a solution to the planetary problems, but also that it often exacerbated these problems. For example, by facilitating the construction of coal plants in places where nuclear plants have been canceled. For the newly illuminated Linus, any solution to the planet's problems had to lie in conscious planetary management on the part of humans, embracing science-backed solutions while giving up on any fantasy of uncontaminated nature. Now, so far, so blandly unproblematic. Yet the god species has a weird parochialism to it. This is manifested in the proposal to abandon any such unpleasantries as calls for limiting human growth and productivity, or God forbid, capitalism, the profit principle, or the market. Now, Linus suggests we focus instead on identifying, and I kid you not, a safe space in the planetary system within which humans can operate and flourish indefinitely in whatever way they choose. So the humanist tone for this argument is already set in the book's hubristic opening. An account of entrepreneur Craig Venter's experiment with synthesizing life retold as a neo-biblical story. Uh, then man said, let there be life, and there was life. What is meant here is that the synthetic genome Venter had developed in his lab in 2010 started reproducing, except it's not the full story. Venter's team said the computer manual of man versus nature. Now, Linus admits to being tired of the idea of perennial human victimhood and thus offers to reboot the human as a god species whose only trajectory is upwards. His, his is therefore a version of what eco-entrepreneur Erlis Erler has called a good Anthropocene, one in which humans can be proud of their achievements rather than lose too much sleep over the side effects. But the good Anthropocene is really a new version of the good man, 
a prelapsarian Adam that can go back to, and commune with God, while also knowing that God is nothing else but a mirror image of his own self. At the end of the day, there is just Adam, a white Christian Adam playing with himself. There is no God, no serpent, and perhaps most significantly of all, no Eve. Indeed, no, Eve gets a say in Linus's New Jerusalem, as it has been designed as a safe space in which the white man can safely rejoice in his own ingeniousness. There is also no dissensus, no conflict, and no inherent contradiction in the wishes and desires of the inhabitants of this safe space, because they are all just imaginary clones of our man 2.0. It is therefore perhaps understandable what Linus, that Linus should joyfully declare. This is no time for pessimism. However, when listening to his story about planetary catastrophes and ways of overcoming them, we should be mindful of feminist theologian Catherine Keller and her reflection that an apocalyptic narrative is absolutely optimistic for its own believers, though radically pessimistic as to human historical aspirations. In the world of Linus and his post-nature eco-mates, it's Eve and other earthly creatures that have become extinct. And these historical aspirations on the part of the human may soon be superseded anyway because their holder will himself undergo a planetary transformation. The apocalyptic sounding end of, end of man will therefore be an upgrade, an evolution of the fleshy model that is becoming obsolete thanks to AI and other technologies. And thus, if the planet is proving to be more and more uninhabitable, the next logical step for the redeemers of today is to reach for what Linus calls, without irony, a techno fix. This perhaps explains the renewed interest in 1980s cyborg discourses, which are now returning in the guise of human enhancement research, gerontology, and AI. The Anthropocene thus ushers us not just ap apocalyptic narratives about the disappearance of man as a species, but also redemptive discourses about the human's upgrade, about the remodeling of the old design for the global post-warming area. Man 2.0 as homo deus seems to be a fulfillment of a prophecy issued by entrepreneur Stuart Brand of the whole Earth catalog fame. We are as gods and have to get good at it. Now, the notion of homo deus has recently made a literal appearance in an eponymous volume penned by another visionary of the whole world, Yuval Noah Harari. After Sapiens, Cosmic History of the Human, set in deep time, Harari has now turned his attention to the currently popular genre of secular prophecy, which nevertheless remains steeped in religious overtones. Given that famines, plagues, and wars have been supposedly conquered, or at least reined in as far as the prosperous regions of the world are concerned, with sugar now being da more dangerous than gunpowder, the only barrier left is fleshiness him itself, he claims. Yet just as climate change is seen by the proponents of the good Anthropocene as requiring a technical fix, the Anthropos himself is seen as fully fixable to an extent where death becomes rebranded as technical glitch. Citing research and investment into solving death by inventor Ray Kurzweil, Google Ventures investment fund manager Bill Marys and PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel, Harari concludes, the writing's on the wall. Equality is out, immortality is in. The fantasy of immaculate conception will thus be realized, seemingly by 200, 2200, with others offering 2050 as the deadline, by instating Silicon Valley venture capitalists as fathers of immortality, regenerating life one cell at a time. Harari seems neutrally diagnostic most of the time, although occasionally his impassive narrative borders on the critical. For example, when looking at the ideology of dataism, which rebrands humans as data processing units, and then sets off to reap the benefits of this rebranding. Yet Homo Deus actually preserves a rather conservative version of man as a future-proofed survivor, with his organs regenerated and his tissue replenished for generations to come or replaced by more durable, non-organic parts. Such developments occur against the uncanny valley of silicon capital, with its geoeconomic fault lines obscured by the Nasdaq indices. Harari's chapter on the Anthropocene ends with humanist triumphalism, whereby the ostensible critique of the humanist model, propped up by notions such as the soul, language, or individuality, ends up celebrating human ingenuity. 
What's missing from Harari's account is an acknowledgement of the very gesture on the part of this human actor to carve out the Homo sapiens as a discrete entity, to intricate him, her, from the various material and political entanglements, and to speculate about his developmental uh, trajectory into the future, radical evolution of the mind, his merging with robots and computers. Harari does recognize that the human is just another kind of animal and actually made, uh, makes numerous pitches for veganism as the only ethically defensible stance with regard to coexisting with other species. But his arrow of time still flies alongside the history of man as we know him, only slightly more re-engineered. The problem therefore lies not with the cognitive restrictions that the future imposes on us, the problem lies with the cognitive blind spot Harari brings to his understanding of the human as a discrete subject of history, a diminished yet ultimately solipsistic robocop who may just succeed in getting away with a whole Anthropocene unpleasantness because he's better than other species at teaming up with other robocops and at intervening stories and inventing stories, sorry, and transmitting them to his genetic kin. Rats, cockroaches, and microbes, no obvious storytellers, as far as we can tell, will most likely prove him wrong. So should man's upgrade progress fail or take too long, an alternative uh, counter-anthropocene plan is currently under development, man's planetary relocation. Faced with the pro prospect of an impending apocalypse on Earth, many scientists, inventors, and entrepreneurs are already lining up to embark on a celestial trip. Wheelchair-bound theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking has joined the queue, recently announcing, I think the human race has no future if it doesn't go to space. So the supposed inevitability of cross-planetary migration is usually presented via the familiar colonizing rhetoric with its gendered assumptions about dominion and conquest and its eschatological fantasies of the disembodied mind. Um, I'm mentioning all this, all this here uh, because the notion of the singular genius uh, that can offer us this kind of liberatory trip returns in the current speculation on both AI and planetary travel, with attempts to take us there presented precisely as an adventure planetary an adventure trip led by bold male pioneers bravely venturing where few would dare to go. The gendered connotations of these ambitions are quite explicit. explicit. Elon Musk, inventor and founder of Tesla Motors and SpaceX, uh, the latter being a company that will take us to Mars, is a case in point. Musk's spiraling ambitions are widely praised by Silicon Valley, with commentators frequently comparing him to eponym eponymous Iron Man superhero Tony Stark. In the keynote presented at the 67th International Astronautical Congress in Guadalajara in September 2016, Musk explained that the two fundamental paths were facing humanity today, staying on Earth and eventually becoming extinct or developing into a spacefaring civilization and a multi-planetary species. Dreams of life on Mars have, of course, a long history. But what's new about Musk's plan, it's not so much his desire to find life, sophisticated or emerging on Mars, but rather his ambition to take life to Mars in the form of human cargo. Planning to start colonization in 2022, the main obstacle in realizing them at the moment is the high cost of spacecraft construction, something Musk promises to address by developing a so-called SpaceX interplanetary transport system. Musk's astronautical congress keynote was richly illustrated with seductive images of pointy and hard bullet-like rockets with rounded heads steaming, throbbing, and then rising up to pierce the Earth's pink and soft atmosphere on their journey to Mars. It was CGI space porn of the highest caliber, and it was being lapped up by the wild crowd. So just the last minute, by way of ending my talk and of suggesting how to envisage other ways of being in the world, other ways of being human and being non-human, beyond the narrow parameters of the AI debate, the way it's currently staged in kind of both in the big in, uh, investment events and in kind of media, and that remains haunted by the specter of the planetary scale catastrophe, call it uh, the Anthropocene or the end of man or the end of our planet, I would like to kind of propose something I'm calling a feminist uh, counter-apocalypse. 
So it's a kind of narrative that draws still very much on scientific uh, developments around kind of planetary science, around kind of Earth system science, around research in robotics, engineering, uh, and computing, and so on, but tries to acknowledge a kind of more distributed model of subjectivity one that recognizes humans' entanglements, not just, you know, with a robot being or not being other, our other eye, but thinking about our kinship with uh, bacteria, with microbes, the models that are drawing on perhaps later research in artificial life, in which a different form of kind of identity and modeling uh, emerges. And because I've run out of time, but it's part of a bigger project in which I'm going to conceptually propose and kind of critique some of the gender assumptions behind the current debate, but also propose, I think, ethically and politically better uh, subjectivity models for thinking about that kind of relationality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Could you please Stay a little more with us on stage and Robert also please come back to us because now we're going to have the opportunity to ask some questions to both of them. Are there any questions in the audience to Robert or Joanna? Yeah. Do we have them? Where's the mic? Okay. Hi. Professor Ishii first and then the lady in red. Hi, good morning. I'm Hiroshi from MIT, and I really appreciate this opening to set the stage about AI. Uh, when I landed MIT 22 years ago, Professor Marvin Minsky was next to my office. He's the founder of AI. Dartmouth Conference 1950 was beginning. But the 1980s, the new movement of distributed AI came. So today, seem AI is singular, I is still singular. But now everything, including bacteria, environment, become intelligent. We have so many intelligence, maybe using a term Horst Heltner is insisting, uh, claiming. So in the era of the ecosystem, massively parallels intelligence. Maybe singular AI or I may not work anymore to understand. So I wonder what kind of a conceptual framework or theoretical framework would be useful for us to think about the era of the massively uh, complex ecosystem that virtually everything can have kind of the intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously what I'm trying to do with this project as well, on the one hand, to look at certain threats and promises that we humans articulate about our own positioning in the world, drawing on uh, you know, different uh, kind of research in that you, you've mentioned and identifying different stages uh, in kind of robotics and engineering, cybernetics. At the same time, I'm slightly surprised and disappointed by a return of some very conservative and truncated models, partly in popular imagination, but partly in the way they also borrowed by many researchers who kind of seem to have taken certain steps back. It's almost ignoring all the kind of models of connectivity. Now I'm wary of moving towards just, or oh, everything is connected. Because if we just say, well, everything is connected with everything else, we end up with banality. So that for me, and in my philosophical work, which kind of builds, uh, uh, I come out of continental philosophy and I work with media theory, but I work with the notion of the cut. You can find the notion of the cut in Bergson and Deleuze, and you can find it in, in Karen Barrett now working with physics. So the notion of the cut is a moment of a resolution. And the human as an agent in whom we humans have a lot of investment in a narcissistic way, makes these cuts, enacts cuts. So even though everything is connected with everything else, not everything is connected in the same way. And that kind of, so on the one hand, you rec recognize, expand the scope of subjectivity, or, or you know, model of connectivity. On the other hand, you still return through a kind of ethical political probing to enacting these cuts on various scales and ask questions from the position of here and now. And they are not just engineering, technical, or even philosophical questions. They are political questions, economic questions, social questions. How do we cut that, through that connectivity? Who enacts these cuts? How do we know that certain connections matter more than others? Who is in control? Who decides about these connections? 
Да это вот... Yeah, uh, good morning. Thanks for both uh, your talks, very interesting. But I only have a question uh, to uh, Robert uh, regarding, of course, uh, this concept of emotions in AI. And you were mentioning like um, intentions, desires, and what was the third category? Beliefs, yes. And I would like to ask um, you uh, uh, to tell us a bit more about the, this concept of emotions because I'm not sure if a belief or a intention really can be called an emotion. Isn't an emotion much more like something like uh, being sad, happy, angry, whatever. So I'm not sure if it's, if it's um, just some kind of brand using the concept emotion, you know, the, the, the idea of emotion, to put it on some, um, again, maybe more rational uh, considerations, how to, to deal with these problems of um, what you were telling us, deep learning and so on. Thank you. Ah, super. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, you have independently, it was developed in the mid 90s, this concept of beliefs, desires, emotions as a general concept, how we should attempt to model personality, but only a very simple first version. I didn't mention, by the way, you would need a theory of mind in your belief system, which makes it very complex because it has to be reflexive, etc. It turned out that you can't build a good model of personality without taking into consideration emotions. Because we have motivations, but what makes us act, bring us to intentions, is that we have an emotional reward. The outcome should be influencing us in a positive, emotionally positive way. And therefore the personnel, and, and there are many other aspects of emotions, for example, uh, memory retrieval depends on very much on emotions. You remember things better if um, they are emotionally loaded or communication, interaction. Emotion enables you to see uh, 20 meters away in which status or emotional state a person is, at least vaguely. But you usually don't have a chance to hear the person, to touch the person, but you see the expression of emotion. So emotions turn out to be extremely important, in, especially in the times we now have. You know, for example, we are working with an Austrian internet uh, newspaper, Standard AT. Like many other journals, they run into the problem that during the last two, three years, people have become by far more emotional in their comments. And you have to filter out those comments or to interfere with those people who bring so much emotion that rationality, rational discussion is no longer possible. So you have to make sentiment analysis of comments. So we are in a sometimes exaggerating emotional era, um, but I think if it will cool down, I hope it will cool down, uh, then, then 
we, we need emotions in modeling of personalities. Hmm? Does that answer your question? Part of <laughs> we because meet I think I think it's interesting to uh, you were mentioning now like too many emotions in the in the in the comments, yes. but what kind of emotions? Is it anger? Is it uh, is it so-called bad emotions? And what are the yeah. good ones? You were mentioning rewards, rewarding uh, yeah. uh, good behavior or whatever. Yeah. So I think this is a this a, this is really something which should yeah. be discussed a very much more. complex topic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But thanks for the. Yeah. For the additional for the information. to reply. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We had a third question here. Yeah, also, is it on? Yeah, it's on. Also, a question to, to Robert. Um, emotion is, I uh, understand emotion, what you're saying. It's a trait that can aid to better decisions. But what is about personality? I mean, any artificial system has some intention because that is basically built into it. Without it, it wouldn't do anything. So intention is there. Um, why would it improve technical systems beyond the fact that it might lead to a better, um, uh, to a better user interface because it's more natural to have someone uh, to deal with who has a personality? But beside that, uh, do you see a advantage in the technology sense? And let me add on to the question to the UI. Maybe humans are becoming more like machines in the future, but that is uh, maybe another aspect. Um, yeah, so the, the first question uh, which you raised is, um, I think um, we will get, we will interact by far more with intelligent and probably emotional machines. So we have to try to model them in such a way that we can more easily interact than typing in something or uh, so that, that I think is a prerequisite and they should also understand our emotions. I know that there are scientists who say computers, robots should not express emotions because they are fake, which is true. We, we don't have any computers or robots for now who can feel emotions they can more or less well understand, recognize emotions, process them, and express them. But they don't have the feeling of emotions, as Damasio would, would call that. I think for the interactions, we will need them to understand our emotions. If we are happy or sad, or what, what, our, what we need at the moment. That's one point. The other one is, um, what is the, the long run? Well, if you think of transhumanism, if we don't exist anymore and there will be only robots, wouldn't it be nice that they also have emotions? To I answer, yes. Care, exactly. <laughs> Can I just add quickly to, uh, to that? Um, one question I wanted to raise with regard to the formulation maybe of the debate, and I realize we're coming from completely different disciplines, so some of the differences are disciplinary, but partly my job has always been kind of asking questions of certain formulations around, around science, around technology. And I'm wondering about this positioning of us and them, whether that's the most helpful way, because we are still talking about, you know, robots as them, or robots or cyborgs, or whoever they are, but you both kept mentioning the them bit. And the whole them bit, and the extrapolation of that, of that kind of external entity that we've kind of partly created with our own measurements, our own cognitive apparatus, our own... So I think the connections are kind of already there. And I'm wondering what are the philosophical and political implications of that extrapolation of that construction? Common sense thing, as you can say, well, of course it's there because it's separate, it's standing out there from me. But in some sense, in terms of the, the modeling, the, um, the very production of that kind of uh, relationship, what gets truncated 
in that establishment of that binary between us and them, whether this is the most interesting, most productive way of thinking of that relationship. What kind of control do we retain? What kind of fantasy do we impose through that? Anyway, just a little piece. Thank you. I'm Jochen Büchel from Munich. I try to develop a holistic systems medicine and I'm very thankful that you notioned Henri Bergson, Deleuze and Karen Barrett because I think interaction, interaction, I think we have to cope with this normal causality thinking and my observation is that in Europe there's an ideological barrier huh, that all these uh, systems medicines and nano that they don't cope with really systemic thinking and I think the authors you mentioned, they open it, like John Dupre, maybe you know from Exeter, he does not really do metaphysics, he does not go into neo monologic thinking like Bruno Latour recommended. So my question is, what could we do to overcome ideological barriers? I think that's the problem. Question. It's obviously a question that various disciplines like either cultural studies in Anglo-American world or Kulturwissenschaften in the German-speaking world have been dealing with for a long time. And it's obviously a question for, for the politics of today. What do we do to overcome kind of ideological frameworks? In a way, I don't think we do overcome them. We can create better ones because I'm not, you know, purporting to speak from a neutral position. I adopt, I mean, I've declared that I'm proposing a feminist counter-apocalypse. It is an ideological position. I believe it's kind of ethically more fair, more just. I think it can offer something different. But in a way, I would like to hear from you a little bit more about those kind of models of medicine. Why do you think, I mean, I've got my own theory, but why do you think, especially in medicine, that kind of uh, more connected, more systemic model is not widely adopted? And what kind of models of subjectivity uh, are stopping it from, from being developed? There's one strange fear I have. You know that in Germany, during the Nazi times, there were some developments in the direction of spirituality. They did Himalaya exhibitions, they founded Bircher Müsli, they supported him. So I think, and some people, they think if you go to spirituality, some black, some, some uh, fascist people will come back. That's one, that's a small fear, but maybe it's, uh, Zurich is a little bit different. The Swiss ones seem to be more open. So I think we have to renew thinking about, um, about world images. And um, that's why I'm here. And Zetka in Karlsruhe, you know, that last year they went to Barcelona and had an exhibition with Ramon Yui. He was really a cosmological thinker or your colleague Barbara Maria Stafford, one of the first in the world to reintroduce Kabbalah and neo-Platonic thinking. So I think arts can help to change this and some nice films like uh, Arrival or Matrix, something like this. Thank you. We're going to take one last question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gunther from Vienna. I have a very naive question for both of you. Robert Trappel, thank you for mentioning emotions and artificial intelligence. It would be interesting to talk about intelligence in general, what it is at all. Uh, my naive question is, in how far can upcoming artificial intelligence support us as, as both individuals and as in society in general to cope with our individual and generalized dark emotions, dark rationality. Is there something, a light at the end of the tunnel? Thank you. Yeah, may, may I? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, I have been invited to teach uh, artificial intelligence course at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, which I will do in the fall term. And I do not want to start with AI, I want to start with systems. I think what is missing today, if I see students coming to the university, they have this linear causal thinking. And we first have to tell them about interdependencies, what is a system, what is a structure, which kind of systems exist, to introduce them to a more, you would say, holistic, well, holistic, systemic thinking. And then later to put, for example, AI on top, or many other disciplines, like medicine. Yeah? 
Okay. And to you, your question. Um, about 30 years ago, I wrote an article about how um, computer therapy could function. And um, I had good arguments, I think, at that time for that. For now, I would be very skeptical. We have not really good models of how is the human being, how it does it feel, how does it react, what are the needs of humans. Um, I'm happy to be one of the partners of the Human Brain Project, where we try very carefully and very slowly to approach that questions which may be helpful in the long run that uh, maybe AI systems could help. I don't know if they will be better than other humans, but we'll see. Thank you. My, question, my answer will be quite brief, because in a sense, I mean, I believe that we do have the artificial intelligence we deserve. And maybe in the sense, I, not, not only do I think that we are also animals, I also think we are partly machines. So in the sense, because I don't have this you know, framework of us and them, so in the sense, I do believe, of course, we can instigate processes that far exceed our ability to control them. Again, climate uh, science has indicated those processes at different levels. So, of course, the same will happen with artificial intelligence. But to have these processes that, as you said, benefit the human, in a way, I think this is a question to be resolved at, I think, socio-political and ethical level. And I think it's a question of politics, economics, distribution comes in. So they can't be just resolved, but I'm sure most people would probably be in agreement with that. They can't be resolved in kind of abstract technical terms. They can't be discussed as just techno fixes because they are not technical problems. They are problems. So it's a matter of, even if we recognize that kind of more connected model, there is the matter of returning to what I earlier called the cut. How do we cut? Where do we cut through that network of identities? How do we make these decisions? Who make? Who is in charge? And you know, we know today who is in charge. And they are basically it's a procession of strong men, kind of dressed up and behaving like these kind of robocops. And you see who is in charge of politics, and it's that kind of same rhetoric. So how do we change that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, audience, for your interest. We're going to have a very short break now. A break of only... Yeah. Okay, it's only five minutes. <laughs> it's only a five minutes break, so it's not really a coffee break. Maybe a very short espresso break. We're going to start with the next session on the other intelligence in five minutes. Works fine. <laughs> Works fine. What? I have enough to drink. Yeah. <laughs>
Welcome back. It was only a very short break. Or oh, glad that you're still here. Uh, we're going to start with our second session of today, titled The Other Intelligence. Uh, we're going to address the question how the human thinking is constituted and also how artificial thinking is constituted. And I want to welcome our first speaker of the second session, Beatrice de Gelder. She's a professor of social and effective neuroscience at the Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Her main areas of expertise are visual and audiovisual effective processes related to the perception of faces and bodies. And her current research focuses on face and body recognition and also the neuroscience of art. Today she will talk about the deep mind and the deep mind meeting the deep body. So please welcome Beatrice to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. You had a bit of a hesitation about my deep body title. <laughs> okay, good. Right, here we go. Um, so I'll, uh, just to give, you the pun give away the punchline, I will end up by concluding a uh, bit of Latin, of course, sic, sic transit gloria, it should be sic transit ego, and I will argue in, uh, in favor of ending the kingdom of the I and replace it with the republic of the I. Sounds mysterious, but it's very straightforward. Okay. Um, actually, uh, whatever we, as people have said before me, artificial intelligence mean, means very many things. It's very, very vague. But the important thing, when you want to go to the core of what, what motivates this whole effort, is to go back to Alan Turing. Not to the person who started using the label for commercial purposes, Alan Turing, okay? Now, Alan Turing's ambition was to build, to build a human level, and that's the very important point, general intelligence, okay? And he wanted to do that by scrutinizing the, work, the, the workings of the human brain, which, after all, you may not always think about it, but after all, the human brain is the only known example of a general intelligence, okay? Not and the general intelligence is the absolute central point here. This ambition is, of course, different from the ambition of building a smart system. A small, smart system that, that solves a local problem. If you want to solve a smart system, if you want to build a smart system that solves a local problem, biological plausibility is not needed. And you may, some people may want to call that artificial intelligence. But it's very different from building a general intelligent system for which the human brain is the only existing example. I don't know about other planets, of course, but that. So that's absolutely crucial in the discussion. Okay, so just very, very briefly, how did we get, because AI was a, ter was a term that felt completely in disrepute, in disrepute, and now it's back, so old I knew AI very, very briefly. But importantly, because we still think of ourselves in terms of the old AI, we still think that our brain does serial computations and manipulates symbolic representations. We still say about ourselves, I see a face, I see a body, I see a rectangle, as if our brain is actually manipulating those symbolic representations. Okay? Open the skull, look at the brain, you don't find representations. Okay? And it's terribly misleading that uh, popular versions of, sorry guys, I tried to do around on occasion, but <laughs> it's terribly unfortunate that all the hype around, uh, around, um, around brain scanning has just reinforced this notion that there is a face area in the brain and a body area in the brain and an anger area in the brain. I mean, that's just wrong. Those things are not in the brain in any, in any simple sense of the world. If the word. Okay? They are in the brain in some other sense that we are still trying to understand and do not understand. Okay? I mean, that's really clear. That should be really important. Now, how did we get to new AI by a couple of, uh, by a couple of uh, major changes? People have dropped, neuroscientists and uh, artificial intelligence people have dropped this notion that the brain is a symbolic representation system. Okay? Because th if you would build a system based on symbolic representations, it would be brittle, fragile, it would not be up to, up to uh, any kind of real world task. We are up to a real world task, but the brain, if the brain would work as we think it works, it would not be up to much. Okay? 
So we have gone, gone to, an, and that's the new so-called new AI, we have gone to completely different, to completely different approach. We have dropped the notion of symbolic representation. We have gone to stochastic manipulations and, very important, to highly parallel and that's crucial for my, for my point I make about the end about the self, to highly parallel information processing. Two crucial things, one has been mentioned already, deep learning. Now, deep learning is not, not just some kind of vague term that's deep in any kind of romantic metaphorical sense, like love is deep or so. Deep learning means that there are a bunch of, a cascade of, of systems that manipulate information. A cascade of systems, okay, that, <coughs> that, and that are deep in the sense that there is more than one stage of non-linear feature transformations. However, and people have noticed that, a few people have started noticing that those kinds of systems, and that's terribly frustrating for, for example, neuroscience people using, uh, using uh, deep learning methods, those systems work, but we don't understand them. Because this, they have this kind of black box, inside the black box autonomy of multiple layers. I talked to people, there's a big conference uh, yesterday and today in New York, uh, first in, for a new society of computational neuroscience. And people agree, I can show you, I actually take, took one or two slides from it. People agree that those systems for, for brain representation at some point may work and they are used in AI in an intelligent way, but we do not, we, we must give up understanding those systems. So there is a new discipline evolving, which is actually creating a human, human, human brain comprehensible interface between what AI systems do and what we can say about and get from it. The second thing is uh, reinforcement le learning, which was mentioned already. Now, reinforcement, reinforcement, le reinforcement learning is one of the pillars of the new AI, however, and it is indeed taken from neuroscience, from animal experiments, conditioning experiments. However, it's essential to, to be used in, in, in deep learning methods that are realistic. However, it takes millions of trials to train a system that is based on reinforcement. Okay? So what is it? <laughs> it, is, it is ways of mapping, tries, tries, trials to map the states of the environment to the actions of the system. Now, that's very easily said for me and for you, but that's very complicated and takes millions of trials for, the, for, uh, for an artificial system, okay? So that's, uh, those are, and I'm not saying there is no progress with that, there is gigantic progress, with, but pe people who are clear-headed about this thing, they see, them, they see the extension of the task, right? Now, why is this so complicated? Well, very simply, because the brain is a model of the world built by evolution. Okay? The brain, there's two important things, the brain learns with an efficiency that none of our machine learning methods can match. I'm not being skeptical here, I'm actually taking this slide from a presentation in New York last, uh, last uh, evening. Okay? To build, and important thing, to build a system that would match the brain, new AI needs to build into that system a model of the world. Now, that's again easier said than done for one very trivial reason. The world changes all the time. I move close by, I move away, the world changes. I mean, massive recomputations happen in my visual system when I move closer by or I go away. So we would, be, if you want to have like a, a, real, a, a real model that, of the world, that has to take account, uh, into account that con the dynamic updating. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more specific there. This is a very famous uh, picture in, uh, in vision science. Uh, it's the model in 91 uh, <laughs> that Van Essen uh, drew of the visual system, just the visual system. I'm not talking about the somatosensory system, auditory system, you name it. Just the visual system. Things have not gotten simpler since. Okay? People call this the oil refinery system of the visual brain. Things have not gotten compli less complicated since, to the contrary. Okay? And you'll see me coming now to... Deep, to, deep, to ultimately, I want to talk about deep body, and then, and then that will get the end of this. So, uh, <coughs> one reason why... Uh, so, you have that visual system there, which, is a, which may not look simple to you, but it's, a, in fact, a massive simplification, because it abstracts from all sorts of functions. Now, one function we have been very interested in in the last, uh, the last uh, decade is vision without consciousness. It's seeing without being aware that you see, okay? And that means that you can perform all sorts of orientations in the world, even, by, even if, I, if I ask you, do you see it, you reply no. Okay. 
So there is non-conscious vision. I'm just adding now one dimension to this already very complicated visual system. To give you an example here, uh, this should work. <laughs> Some of the experiments we do to test non-conscious non vision, which we know is there in the brain, is making stimuli we saw invisible. Okay, we do that for example like this. This is well, okay, this, this doesn't, the animation doesn't work, but basically, ah, it does work, okay, it doesn't work on this one. So you see that pattern inside that thick flicker pattern, which people call a Mondrian pattern, is this image hidden, okay? So we ask people, for example, uh, is it a sad or an angry face? Is it a sad or an angry, or angry body, for example? We can use whatever other things. And pe people reliably tell you what they see, what, they, what it is while also telling you that they don't see it. So that's just one complication, of the, one complication of, the, of the visual system. Now, just to anticipate, people have said that in fact, I get some kind of somatosensory signal. If there is an angry body hidden there, then I get some kind of signal from my body that, 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 that uh, directs my answer. It's not cognition in any serious sense of the, but it's an important, you can call it gut feeling actually. I don't, that's another story, I'll get to that. It, it is reliable. Okay? But it's a complication for our understanding of the visual system, and it's certainly a, a complication for our, for our making of a visual system, uh, an artificial making of a visual system. So I have some more examples of that. Uh, now, another complication, interesting one here, is that some parts of the brain, and you don't have to look at these slides, and that's just a typical neuroscience talk, some parts of the brain, which we call the dorsal system, they are, their, act their activity is insensitive to whether or not you say you saw the image. Other parts of the brain are very sensitive to it. When you say you don't see it, the activity goes down. But other parts of the brain are insensitive to that. So the complication plays in just, not in just on one level, but in more levels. That's good. <laughs> People with uh, brain damaged patients, an important source of scientific and societal uh, in, uh, importance, People uh, have strokes, and then when they have strokes, very often they lose, they have lesions in the visual cortex, and the family says, well, he is now blind, he has a stroke, right? Now, we have studied such patients, and this is an extreme case, with destruction of visual cortex on both sides, and what we find is that, for example, this person, when you show him a face with the gaze directed straight at you, we have activity in the amygdala person doesn't see the face or anything. We have less activity in the amygdala for that completely blind person who walks with a white cane, etc., etc., when the gaze direction is like five millimeters, uh, sorry, five degrees away. So the whole visual system, even being unconscious, is very sensitive to these kinds of information, call it affective information, but it also works for non-affective information. And you have a dilation, dilatation, dilatation, dilatation. Uh, when you measure the, the dilation of the pupil, you see that the visual system has perfectly recorded the value of that, of that information. Okay? Um, so that's, so all that, I'm just adding to the level of complexity that, uh, that would be needed. Um, other important things, we, uh, now I get closer to the body, I was with the eyes, I'm moving to the body now. We've seen, we now from experiences in virtual reality, which we do and we do together with our colleagues, that uh, when I embody you as a child, and I make you, uh, make you show the grip, the hand grip, that would, that would be needed for the object you see in the virtual environment, that it depends on whether you are embodied as a child or as a normal adult, how the grip, uh, how, how the aperture of the grip is. So your body determines how you interact, how you interact with the world around you, even in virtual, specifically in virtual reality. That means that it's relatively independent from all sorts of beliefs you can have. You know you're in virtual reality, okay? You, but somehow that, 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 that knowledge exists on a separate plane from when I tell you, show, how, show you the hand, the hand grip you would, have to, you would have to have to take that object. So, you are moving towards my basic, basic notion that there exists multiple systems together in our brain-body interaction. 
And of course, the discussions on artificial intelligence have tended to concentrate way too much on only, I mean, you have to begin somewhere, of course, or only, only seeing thinking as this kind of cognitive, cognitive thing. And as I said, remember, we will ultimately need a model of the world if we want to have a good artificial system. Um, something else, which is sort of, I show because it's sort of funny, our body is, of course, uh, not a tool, not only a tool for our perception, it's, it also gives continuous signals we are not aware of. I've already mentioned pupil dilatation, which pe some people may know as an important signal you react to without knowing it. Another one is the temperature on the face. This is a study done by my friends in, friends in Rome, where they have used a thermal camera, Okay. Now, with a thermal camera, I can very, very clearly measure the heat in your face. Okay. Now, it turns out in this experiment, which is a sort of a game, a game, a computer game played, that the tip of the nose, okay, the temperature at the tip of the nose, is very, very, uh, very, very closely correlated with what you believe about about how you can cheat in a certain situation. So that's another example. You could, of course, say, well, AI can integrate all that, right? Sure. That, but uh, as we, that's easier said than done. So the, here you see the tip of the nose and what's... Uh, and uh, you recognize this section as... That's just a section of the face here. And you see the difference in temperature between the cheeks and the nose there. Okay, I'm not going to give any details if you want. I mean, these are published studies. Another thing I care about very much, and we've mentioned already, is that uh, there is... We've talked about the visual system so far, but there is, of course, a very close and much closer than you realize association between what the visual cortex does and what mental imagery does. This is a study where we uh, use 3D printed bodies, and our goal was to, to, <coughs> to see to what extent uh, recognizing uh, things by touch, by sound, and by vision uh, uh, uses the same brain resources. And I think it's important to, to stress that in mental imagery, which is a much underrated and much, Im much more important function of the human brain than we, than we would like to stress, it uses all the resources of the visual and of the auditory cortex. You see, it's not about blind people that they see with their auditory cortex, but in normal visual people also use their auditory cortex, their visual, their auditory cortex for visual purposes. We have to extend our notion of these neat packages of uh, sensory systems in the brain. Um, oh yeah, this one I put in here for to stress another aspect. We tend to we tend to think of perception as passive. And in, in, um, consistent with the, the notion I said at the beginning, we need a model of the world if we want to get somewhere. Perception is actually an important aspect of perception is what we call perception action loops. In, in many cases, perception is directly linked to action. So that's just, I'm not going to go into this uh, slide. Now, another one, and uh, you could read this in the paper, uh, in the Austria paper I did at breakfast, read the German paper at breakfast, um, that uh, this is about, about uh, ten, 10 things you don't know about the gut. 10 fascinierende Fakten, Fakten über den Darm. And uh, one of the things, number 10 is, the other ones may are not that interest here, is that there is a lot of nerve connections between the, between the midbrain, midbrain and the gut. There are many more. I mean, the midbrain talks to the gut, but the gut doesn't talk back. The gut just goes its own way and does, and does things and make you decide things pretty much out of your, out of your, uh, I mean, you can register it, but you can't control it. Okay, uh, there is no time I would like to talk about the dance project, because that, uh, which we have, which is funded by H, uh, H Horizon 2020, and where we specifically are trying the, to, uh, we have dancers, videos of dancers, and we measure in all possible ways what those dancers do, and try to map that against the brain data. Now, that is incredibly complicated. We try, for example, to map the, uh, the, the judgments of people. Uh, I ask people, is there a lot of movement in this dancing clip? Do you like the dancing clip? We, have, uh, we use the computer program to recognize the dancing clip, and we try to find some match between that and the brain data. And uh, it's complicated, but it's very interesting because of course, somehow we all think that those artificial systems, that they, are, that they easily map onto our brain uh, process, but that's not the case. Right, so what is needed to push artificial intelligence forward um, towards human intelligence level, 
remember, for me, the serious questions about, about artificial intelligence are not, are not the, local, the, the local system that do specific things. It's the notion of a, general human, of a general intelligence. I'm not saying general human intelligence, but a general intelligence of human level. And we don't know a better one. There may be one out there, but uh, good. So what's needed, I said, is modeling the world is to have in such a system the ability to explain, and to explain and understand its sensory input. It's also the ability, remember my mental imagery study, the ability to imagine worlds. We are forever imagining, uh, imagining alternative possibilities, imagining alternative words, worlds. Okay? And of course, that's very important for creativity, for art, etc. Those are trivial things to say. But we tend to forget that this is a central ability of the brain constantly imagine alternative worlds. And, of course, that's essential for planning actions. You cannot plan your actions if you're stuck in the present world. Okay? Now, what's happening then? What's going to happen? What's going to go wrong? Uh, what's going to go right? As I said, the brain, the brain itself is a model of the world built by evolution. Okay? The efficiency I've talked about, the system that <laughs> the AI needs a system of the world. Now, the world and our interactions with the world are built with the body. The body is a signaling and an interaction system. It's, the, in some extent, the body that, uh, that, uh, that uh, changes, that constantly changes the world. I mean, the simple case, I mean, things get bigger as I go close by, they get smaller. We tend to think those things are trivial, but I can tell you that the computations, understanding the computations that go on are far from being trivial. Okay? And the model of the world that AI need, will need is one of body-world interactions. Okay? Now, uh, if we, if we have that, and now comes the slightly controversial part of my story, because if we have that, we're going to have some kind of distributed eye. We're gonna have, because remember, the gut, the gut talks to the, the brain, talks to the gut, but the gut does not talk back to the brain. So do I know my gut? Do I know the level of acidity in my stomach? No. I mean, I may carry some measurement, and I may carry all sorts of wearables on me that constantly feed me information about my state. But they are all going to be like, like I have a gut uh, eye, eye in the sense of me. I have a gut eye. I have an, uh, uh, a dermal, a dermal skin conductance. I, all those things, and we tend to believe they are integrated. They are not. I mean, scientists have not found a way of integrating all that information. For one thing, because all that information has a different time scale. I mean, heart rhythm as a, as a time time scale. Um, Sacades of the eye, they all have different time scales, and we have this gigantic notion of ourselves as if I inside me, me inside my brain, I know how to, I'm, I'm like the supercomputer that combines all this information, which is not true. I mean, there is no evidence for that. So, in a way, I'm always the ghost outside the machine. Uh, so, what um, as, and this is kind of the claim you may, you, you, that's uh, probably uh, slightly controversial. So rather than being the I as the knower of my own states, I'm just going to become as, very, as I have more, accumulate more wearables, more scientific information about all those aspects of the body, about the relation body world, etc. I'm just going to be some kind of manager of my body. Okay? I mean, I can, I can underwrite a check about, I can, agree with, I can agree with the output of my blood pressure, I can agree with the output of my belief system, I can then, but the eye becomes less and less cognitive the more we understand about it. So what's left is some kind of normative, what I call a normative eye, some kind of, some kind of uh, not even decision-making, because there's a lot of decision-making that's going on here and there, that's going on continuously. I can sort of still be, so I have some kind of moral authority, Instead of, uh, instead of being this cognitive entity that I, that I claim to be. So that's then that the I would more and more become normative rather than empirical, uh, and uh, we, may, we may sort of want to remove the, the, the kingdom, the kingdom of the I, this is sort of rhetorical end of talk uh, stuff, you know, uh, the kingdom of the I, the republic of the eyes, and sort of the manager of the, the, manager of the different eyes that I have around. Okay, that was me. Thank you. That was me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beatrice, for the moment. Please take a seat again. We're going to have a combined uh, Q&A session again, as in the first session after the second talk. 
I want to introduce you to the next speaker now. I cannot see him. Memo, Akten, where are you? Here is he. Um, he's a wonderful artist. He's born in Turkey, currently based in London. And I think I could call you an old friend of Ars Electronica. Memo is uh, the winner of um, probably the most prestigious Cyber Arts Award in the world. It's Ars Electronica's Golden Nike, for sure. Uh, he got a Golden Nike for animation um, back in um, 2013 for the work Forms, which was a beautiful series of animations on human motion. Please check it out online if you haven't seen it before. He's currently doing a PhD at Goldsmith University of London in artificial intelligence and expressive human machine interaction. And today he asks, do intelligent machines actually, actually know things? Memo, please. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, actually, is there a handheld mic? This is quite low. Is there a handheld? Yeah, I mean, is this, can you hear me if I speak like this? Oh, okay, cool. So my machine actually just died about an hour ago. I had to open it up, so I hope this is going to work. Um, I think it works, right? Cool. So thanks for the introduction. It's quite an honor to be sharing a stage with such distinguished speakers. So I am going to talk about intelligent machines that learn. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. Uh, I am a computational artist. I've been doing this for quite a few decades. And at the age of 40, I decided to start doing a PhD. I didn't realize how much work that actually was. But so I'm doing a PhD now in machine learning and applying it to basically my practice. But what I want to talk about today is not my actual PhD research, which is a bit more kind of on the technical side. I want to talk about some of the things which I take from what I learn and feed into my practice. Um, there should be audio. Yeah. So first, I want to talk about my work prior to my PhD, and or rather getting into machine learning, to kind of give context to where I come from and where I'm going. I've always been really interested in computational systems and using them to abstract nature and what we learn through science and creating interactive systems that we can somehow, well, play with and use to express ourselves. I really like the metaphor of musical instruments where there's a creative feedback loop and we can just connect with the system for example, a piano, and just make it an extension of our body. And a lot of this work that you're seeing here is just, it's all custom software, it's all real time, it's all interactive. I guess you could argue that it's called, that it's AI. I don't like the term AI because it's too, too vague. Anything can be AI, anything can not be AI. So I just call these procedural systems. And really, what I like to talk about now and what, what I'm working with is machines that learn. So machines that, because there's no really vagueness in that description. If, you, if a machine has, as it gains experience, it becomes better at a particular task. And that's really what I'm working with. And I'm looking at these systems both as a way to augment my practice. So on a practical level where I design systems, machine learning systems, where I can um, design interactive computational systems, but also I'm now even more interested in the potential implications of these machine learning algorithms, both on a societal and cultural level, but also the kind of philosophical um, implications that might come about of it. So we're here to talk about AI. Um, it's really hot these days, and it's going to change the world. And this is what it looks like. It turns out it's very blue and shiny. And this is the trend for the term AI, or artificial intelligence, in Google News for the last 10 years. You can see it's pretty flat with a few odd spikes, and then it starts spiking around um, 2014. Well, it starts rising, and then there's a big explosion in 2016. And this is the trend for the term big data, which is completely flat until about 2011, 
and then it kind of plateaus for a bit and explodes in 2015. Now, there's no coincidence that after a steady period of big data, we have an explosion of AI. And there's many reasons that I really like this correlation. One is the provocative statement that perhaps consciousness is evolution's solution to dealing with uh, big data. Uh, an analogy where in Darwinian evolution of as simple organisms started to develop more and more complex senses to deal, um, and then they had to develop higher levels of cognition to process those really high dimensional inputs. And perhaps especially about half a billion years ago during the Cambrian explosion when vision evolved, and we also see correlations with the really increased diversity of, of life as organisms started to be able to see and hunt prey or rather evade predators and they needed to be able to manage this really, really high dimensional data with their limited neural bandwidths so that they could more optimally make decisions. And to go even further, some organisms even started to be able to model the environment to make better predictions and even model other living entities so that I don't see all of you as these you know, billions of atoms fluctuating in a quantum field or as lots of organic cells just moving through space, but I can model you as individuals with thoughts and goals and desires. It's almost like an API to your whole body. So I find this in itself quite fascinating, but there's another reason why we're having an explosion in AI, of course, because the businesses that are funding this huge AI research they rely on making sense of data. They rely on understanding data, extracting information from a sea of numbers. That's what their businesses depend on. Likewise with the GCHQ, the NSA, the Five Eyes, they're collecting more data than they, than they know what to do with. And what they need is they need algorithms to produce executive summaries and report to our puny little human minds. So they're all investing billions in this field. So it's safe to say that if World War I gave us analog computers and World War II gave us digital computers and the Cold War gave us the internet, mass surveillance of targeted advertising and the war on terror is giving us deep learning and AI. But there's even another reason that I really find fascinating. God comes up a lot in my work and it's actually come up today quite a few times as well. Or more broadly speaking, I'm interested in the tensions between uh, science, technology, nature, ethics, ritual, tradition, and religion. And there's some really fascinating parallels between the rise of AI and mass surveillance through the lens of the ultimate panopticon, that is religion, the all-seeing eye of God. There's, it's no secret that there's really incredible correlations between the characteristics of the society and the modes of subsistence, and the forms of overseer, whether the overseer is a wrathful overseer or more of a, um, a, a deistic uh, spiritual religion. And I find it really fascinating that it was these ancient religions that imposed omnipotent, omniscient powers, watching over us and judging us, protecting us. And these were myths that were fabricated to control the masses. And now as we're losing our spiritual sensibility, and we're drowning ourselves in materialism and technological submission, our overseer too is adapting, it's, it's co-evolving. Its metaphysical traits are crumbling and they become obsolete. And that void is being filled with new traits that reflect our own. They're physical and material and digital to match our own lifestyles. And we don't fear the old gods anymore, they can't protect us. So we need new ones. We killed God, as Nietzsche says, but we're rebuilding him with technology to match our techno-culture. The myth is becoming real, an actual, authentic, man-made deity living up in the cloud of all places. I mean, come on. Watching over us, listening to our thoughts and dreams in ones and zeros. But it gets even more interesting because this overseer in the cloud, which used to watch us and protect us and punish the bad and learn our innermost desires to provide personalized guidance and comfort and ads. Now it learns and it becomes more intelligent too. It makes decisions for us with so-called cognitive APIs, 
We query it with a question, and it replies with an answer. It used to be that we had offloaded our thinking to devices that we own, devices that we keep at home, we keep in our pocket, we ask it, and it, we get an answer. But now those devices are just portals to communicate with the cloud, where our message goes, and then the reply comes back in this new language of scripture called JSON. And it doesn't even end there. The churches of the old gods had taken it upon themselves to be the purveyors of art and culture, to be the inspirers and storytellers or history makers, to be the commissioners and funders of art and culture. And now we have this. So in 2014, I wrote a poem. It's a collaboration with Google. Not people working at Google, but actual Google, the search engine. Um, and we have a very intimate connection with the cloud. We confide in it, we confess to it, we appeal to it, we share secrets with it that we wouldn't share with, any, with our family or closest friends. And it's the keeper of our collective consciousness. It sees everything we see, knows everything we know, it feels everything we feel. So this poem is actually more a collection of, a collection of prayers. Um, I'm going to skip it because it, you can find it online. I want to get back to the main theme, um, which is AI. Um, like I said, I'm going to talk about machine learning because I find that more interesting. Actually, so my machine died. I have to skip now to a different part of the presentation. Yeah, sorry about that. So, Lady Ada Lovelace, a lot of you might know her as the world's first computer programmer. She was 17 when she started working with and became the intellectual collaborator and peer of Charles Babbage, who was 42 at the time. He was building these giant mechanical computers, or rather designing them and getting into arguments about funding. Um, so he's considered the father or the grandfather of the first general purpose computer, and it's through Ada's notes that we know so much about these machines because she kept a really um, detailed notes and that's where her first computer program is. And she had a lot of foresight, centuries of foresight. She, for example, the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just so the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And one of her most profound insights was while Babbage was mostly interested in a machine that could calculate anything, she saw the potential in symbolic computation to be able to do more than just number crunching, but for example, compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree or complexity or extent. And she said this about two centuries ago, really perhaps preempting the generative art movements that we've seen over the past, computational art movement over the past 50 years. But she had made this very controversial statement as well. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatsoever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to do in order to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical revelations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And this is very controversial because two centuries later, we're still arguing about this statement. In, 19, in his seminal 1950 essay, Alan Turing addresses this statement. He calls it, well, sorry, he starts this essay with, can a machine think? And again, a century later, or 70 years later, we're still thinking about this. He calls this Lady Lovelace's objection. And he goes on to add, machines take me by surprise with great frequency, because he phrases this problem as a way, well, if a machine can surprise even its programmer, then perhaps we can call that machine <coughs> give the, the ability to do something that the program I had not intended. And he had the insight a few years prior to actually propose machines that can learn. And he reframes this question in the context of machines that can learn. And he says, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one that simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. 
He goes on to say, an important feature of a learning machine is that its teacher will often be very largely ignorant of quite what is going on inside. And this is both one of the greatest strengths of machine learning, but also one of the greatest dangers, because with these black box systems, as it's been discussed today, we really don't know what it's going to produce. We can understand how it gets there, like the maths is actually quite understandable, but it's unpredictable. One other thing from this period I really love to say, it's um, again a quote from two centuries ago regarding our inability to deal with these computational systems or our lack of understanding, especially lack of public understanding, is a quote from Charles Babbage. On two occasions I've been asked by members of parliament, pray Mr Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that can provoke such a question. I want to now jump back to a different part of the presentation. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten, okay. So back to AI, or rather machine learning. So a very quick overview, this is a gross simplification. Normally, if you were to write a program, one might think of it as you write a function f, which maps an input x to an output y. In machine learning, or a supervised machine learning, just one very tiny fraction, you just give it examples of x and y, and it learns what f is. And deep learning is f is replaced by a very complex, long function. Lots and lots of layers, and this is why it's called deep. And each of these layers is in itself a nonlinear transformation, as was mentioned before. And literally, when you pipe data through a neural network, it is a journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time. And in the depths of these networks is the great unknown. The journey for each of us begins here. The journey for each of us begins here. We're going to explore the cosmos in a ship of the imagination, unfettered by ordinary limits on speed and size, drawn by the music of cosmic harmonies. It can take us anywhere in space and time. Perfect as a snowflake, organic as a dandelion seed, it will carry us to worlds of dreams and worlds of facts. Come with me. So, the depths of the neural networks, I find a really, really fascinating space to explore. It is literally like exploring space. So this is Deepream, you might, some of you know from about two years ago, it came out, research at Google. It kind of inverts a neural network that's been trained to recognize images, and it tries to produce images that maximize particular firings in the depths of the neural network. So a network might be trained to recognize animals or whatever, and then you give it a new image, like my face, and then you take a group of neurons that, for example, were designed or had learned to recognize a scaly texture in a bird, and then you maximize the input so that that is amplified. It's a bit like you stare at a cloud and you see something like a, a rabbit, and then you draw what you see, and then you look at what you drew, and then you draw again what you see. So there's this feedback loop, or like it's like confirmation bias feedback loop. But what I really like about this is the images that it's producing, we look at them and we say, oh, it's all about puppy slugs and bird lizards. But actually, there are no puppies or slugs or birds in these images. I am completing that picture. The neurons in my brain, which uh, have learned to recognize reptiles or slugs, are firing the same way that they were firing in that neural network. And then I'm completing this feedback loop. So I really, really like using these algorithms as a way to reflect on ourselves and how we make sense of the world and the biases that we have within ourselves. One of the works I'm showing here is called Learning to See. Uh, this is a similar network that hasn't been trained on anything. So it's a webcam, it's, it's set up somewhere over there. And it's basically trying to understand what it's seeing. And in this context, understanding means finding regularities in what it's seeing right now and comparing it to the regularities of what it's found before and trying to reconstruct what it's seeing. And for example, when I move, it completely goes off because it doesn't know that if I'm here, 
that the laws of the universe dictate that if I move over a bit, I should look the same. So it, these are all things that it has to, it has to learn. Um, this is the installation version. Um, it, this has been running for maybe about five minutes at this stage when I filmed this. The panel on the left is a live reconstruction, so the network is trying to reconstruct what it's seeing based on the, the hierarchies of features that it's learned so far. The panel on the middle is sampling a random point in the latent space which it thinks is similar to what it's seeing right now, but still obey the laws of the worlds that it's, it's learned. In that, it's a completely random image, but it still has very world-like qualities. And the panel on the very right is a completely random image. So this is literally white noise that is being passed through the neural network, and the neural network is shaping that white noise into these images, which is effectively a kind of its um, memory. The other project I have here is called Fight. It's a VR piece. It's in the Arts Electronica Center. Um, it's on the ground floor, but in a bit of a, you know, in a mezzanine. And there's a few things that I really wanted to convey with this VR piece. They've actually all been discussed today as well. So one of them is what we perceive to be real, what we see is a reconstruction in our minds. It's a simplified model of the world, limited by our biology and physiology. Perception is an active process. It requires action and integration. The actions that we take affects the reality and the meaning that we construct in our mind. And most importantly, even when presented with the same information, the same images, everybody will experience, will see something completely unique and personal. And I have no idea what you will see. And we are often able, unable to understand what you see. And I'm interested in all of these questions, both on a, you know, a lower level perceptual level, but also on a much more higher level, especially considering the kind of social polarization that we're feeling, that we're seeing right now um, in the States, in the UK where I live, in my home country of Turkey, where we're really, really unable to perceive the world from other people's eyes. And we somehow believe in these absolute moral truths. So this is a VR installation. This was a presentation at Stripe, who commissioned it. This is the presentation here. Um, and I'll very quickly go through some of the motivations of this. I'll have to skip some of these slides. Um, the eye is often likened to a camera, as if light falls on the retina, and then we form an image. But that's not how seeing happens at all. I, I quite like... So, well, there used to be this theory of vision called the extra mission theory of vision, which um, Plato articulated really well. He believed, or many people believed, that we had a fire. But this fire has the property not of burning, but of yielding a gentle light. And it coalesces with daylight, and is formed into a single homogeneous body in a direct line with the eyes. In short, we shoot these rays, and they coalesce with things out there. And then, through that, we get this sensation of seeing. Of course, he was wrong. Um, many people at the time, even then, Ibn al Haytam, one of the first theoretical physicists, believed in the intromission theory of vision where light falls on the retina, and that is, of course, how it is. But I like the idea, the one thing I like about the exhibition theory of light is that it communicates that it's an active process. It feels like we're looking out to the world, because the actual part of the eye that's high resolution and full color is absolutely tiny, it's about two millimeters. So even though to me, all of this feels like a window, which I'm looking at from somewhere inside my skull, in reality, I'm scanning. And my eyes are constantly scanning this scene. And Alfred Yarbus in the 60s made some pretty uh, seminal work using what looks like this torture device. And he also found very interestingly that when you ask somebody a question about a particular scene, the way they, the question asked affects the way they scan the scene. So um, if you ask, who is this person? How old is he? What are they talking about? It affects the meaning that we take from this image. So this VR piece uses binocular rivalry. Um, both eyes are presented completely different images. And what happens when that happens is the signals are in the visual cortex somewhere, but only one of the signals gets elevated to the visual um, consciousness. And when it's a full surround image, then you see these really wavy, patchy, patchy things that animate. Even though the content is completely static, you see waves and transitions. And this is unique. This is 
depends on your physiology, what you will actually see. And there's ways to control which side is dominant um, because it kind of flickers between the two. And you can, so the content is relatively simple. Um, it's simple graphics, it's very inspired by this idea of, that I outlined at the beginning. And it goes in and out of rivalry. And one interesting thing is when there is no rivalry with the stereo parallax, you're able to get a visual percept that feels 3D. It feels outside of your body. You, you can see it out there the same way I see you. But when rivalry occurs, the image jumps to inside your eye. It literally feels like the image is right here. Um, and then you see all these transitions. So I'm going to skip this because I'm out of time. I just want to do a live demo if I have time. The music is part of the algorithm. So this is a deep neural network that's been trained on images from the Hubble telescope. Um, and again, I like this metaphor that this algorithm is only capable of understanding what it's seen so far. So if I show it, everything that I show, it's reconstructing the image on the right and my laptop has just died. So um, I guess that's a natural way for me to say thank you for listening. Um, cheers. Thank you very much, Mimo. Beatrice, would you come back to us? Would you join us on stage? We now have uh, 10 minutes of time for questions and answers. Where is the mic? Where are the questions? Who was the first? Thank you. Thank you very much for um, talking about difficult matters. Um, I have, I'm worried about two presuppositions, um, and they are part of both talks, and I wonder how to best approach them. I wonder why is the brain a model of the world? So I'm talking about natural intelligence. The idea, do we really use the brain to make something like a representation? Is it a likeness of the world that's outside of us? So I'm basically joining the worries of the last speaker that there's a dichotomy between us and the world that then says that we, as the I, the subjects, the human beings, we can now, is it a mirror? I mean, we can create a model. So that's the first presupposition that I'm really worried about because it leads us to these ideas that the I is something that is superior that can do that. So if we are part of the world, and if our brains are part of the world in a natural way of thinking, then what is the brain doing when it approaches the wor world? Then we talk about perception. And I think that was the most interesting part of both presentations, that the perception action loop, as you called it, you know, that this idea that we interact with the world and that this cognition part that we have um, as philosophers loved and supported over thousands of years seems to be quite difficult. The second problem are the solutions. Because I understand, so we don't have an eye that is also composed and can have, you know, the standoffish quality towards the world. So what do we do instead? And your suggestion was, you know, some sort of normative stance, you know, some sort of... Um, you know, republic, I mean, you, know, you called it a republic, right? I mean, some sort of way to put up re rules that will then tell us how to do this properly, how to have the right, you know, the right imitation or the right um, likeness of the world. Um, because obviously, you know, it's not one person that can be godlike and standing there and doing it. And, you know, this is my worry with your paper. I mean, you put God there, right? So, so that's not bringing us any further. And 
I mean, as a Wittgenstein scholar, as a philosopher, I can only say, I have not ever understood the difference between me and the world, between the language I used to speak about the world and the world that I'm part of. And I think that, you know, algorithms are language, I mean, they are not going to be the solution either. So that's my question to both of you. Okay. I guess both of you want to yeah, add something here. Well, <laughs> Who I wants mean, to start? I can, well, I can, I'll, I'll, oop, I'll start by at least getting, getting away, getting out one question out of the way. When, when I refer to a model of the world, as I, as I uh, qualify it later on, it's a dynamic model. Of the, I said it's easier said than done to say that we need a model of the world to improve, uh, to improve uh, uh, or uh, machine learning because you need the model of the world for us. So it's a dynamic thing and it's changing all the time with my actions in the world. So uh, if we created, if I, or if we created the notion that this is some kind of static representation, that's certainly not the idea. So we can get that out of the way. That's, uh, it's and by saying it's a dynamic, of course, you, this loop thing means that you cannot like separate, I'm here and the world is there, and I'm going to take my camera and take pictures of it, right? That's not a... And so, is that on? So I guess my res hello oh yeah so my response would be my perspective on it is really more not necessarily separating myself from the world but really my understanding of it and our, our understandings not always just by definition a model um, I'm going to pull in an example of when we talk about what gravity is all we can do is build a model of what we think gravity is and that model can change over time and you know it used to be Newtonian mechanics and F equals MA and then Einstein came along with general relativity and expanded on that and it's just a, an attempt a very feeble attempt perhaps at trying to fit a model to the observations there might be a, a ground truth reality out there but we are limited to looking at it through this um, constraints that we are given to us by evolution um, which actually some of the slides that I skipped did talk about some of the different models that different animals might have incredibly simplistic models that they've evolved and that works for them so I think we are limited by our biology in our understanding and using yeah. computational approaches as a way to try and test those hypotheses is one approach to this um, I don't know if that in any way answers your question. Um, what was the second one? Sorry. Second one or what? So, if our natural intelligence is modeled in a certain way, which I was suggesting, right? I mean, that's what we do. We have a certain image of how we learn. And this is your topic, you know, learning and knowledge. I think that's the main problem, that we think that um, knowing about the world is making a model about the world. That was my, you know, that was my major doubt and presupposition. I mean, if we, if, or um, criticism of the presupposition, I mean, if we are going to do artificial intelligence, I mean, we at least, you know, have to try to think beyond what we have been doing as humans, you know, in our own, you know, think of our school systems, think of our university systems. I mean, we have major problems with that. We give knowledge. I mean, we heard talk, the first talk today. We think we give knowledge bits to our students and then they have them, right? I mean, they have to make experiences and they're always already in the world and make those experiences and then they come to school and we tell them, you know, the result of that in a model that we've made that's a theoretical model that they then have to learn. So what I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm just deeply worried about the representational model. I don't think that the world out there is out there and that we then make a model of the world. And I think, you know, your, both your suggestions are based on that model and that was just my, you know. And if it's a static model or a dynamic model, that doesn't make a difference. It's a model, right? Uh, so I just want to quickly add, now it's crystal clear your, your argument. I, I completely agree to one degree in the sense that I'm not, a, I'm not an AI researcher really. Um, my, if, if that's what I communicated then that's a, an error. I, it actually underlines the essence of my presentation which is the meaning that you take depends on who you are and this communication, communication is a really, really difficult thing because that's not what I had intended to say. 
Um, my interest is in using models, computational models, as a way to reflect on specific phenomena that I find fascinating in the way that humans understand and make meaning, and that is that we are incredibly biased, and these algorithms are incredibly biased. So I like to use that as a way to reflect that, not necessarily that this is how humans function. I have no idea how humans function. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, but I find it fascinating that it actually, I think, again, I'm predicting my own bias here, reinforces uh, my belief that we understand based on who we are. This one? Okay. Just to, uh, sure we agree on this one. Uh, and just to stress again, it's not about making a model of an outside reality. Uh, and I would like to stress a point I made, namely that we are forever, as part of our normal, call it natural functioning, we are forever entertaining as like as many balls in the air alternative alternative models it's essential to our to our thinking to to have alternative alternative not not better or worse than the one we are functioning but alternative realities pop up all the time in because because the the, the input to the input to our model making which, and perception is model making in a way the input to it is varying all the time and allows for multiple interpretations all the time Thanks a lot. I, have, I think we, we have to keep discussing that in the break. Uh, I want to give uh, one more audience member the chance to ask one question. Uh, okay. <laughs> you already had one question in the first session, so maybe let's sure. give this lady the chance. Short question, short answers, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to ask, I think it actually follows on this question of perception. And one thing I would, I'm interested in is basically studies of wealthy people, mostly white people in the West, and their total lack of empathy when they or encounter images or notions of poverty or notions of suffering. I mean, maybe this is sort of speculative science, but I get to read these in newspapers and it's my hobby, that they, you know, that the brain waves show that they actually don't, their cognition is just different. And when poor people are shown the same type of imagery, they show more empathy. So the as general assumption that there's some kind of emotion, like human intelligence, which translates into um, something like emotional intelligence or emotions, because what kind of emotions can we expect out of AI if we're already sort of making wrong assumptions about human emotions in the first place? Well, I'll just quickly say, because um, the mic's in my hand, the Personally, I actually have no interest in AI. This is why I avoid the term AI, in creating fully autonomous agents. Um, I find machine learning as a tool, a very fascinating tool to... Like we were speaking about chess earlier, and you know, Kasparov's proposition of centaur chess being a far more interesting um, approach to autonomous chess, whereby humans playing with AI software is really um, a much more... Uh, well, that, that's really a higher level of intelligence. So my personal interest is just using machine learning algorithms as a way of recognizing patterns in data and using that as humans to interpret and augment our own capabilities. So I have no interest in giving emotions to machines or simulating any of that kind of stuff. And with that, I'll... Uh, at the risk of being mis misunderstood, I sort of agree. I have no interest in, in uh, I, I don't see what we are saying when we say that we need to add emotion to AI now. For me, that's pretty meaningless. Um, of course, ultimately, if we were to have the, per the, 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 the perfect copy of me, the, the, uh, the achievement of AI would have to be the perfect copy of me that behaves and, and fe at any level of uh, physiology, etc. But uh, Coming to your rich people who have no empathy, I, number one, as a scientist, I first would really need to see the data because a lot of those studies that are out there in the, in the pop uh, journalism thing are really very shaky stuff. I mean, that's how you get the headlines for 24 hours, uh, but that's, there's, just, uh, there's just so much, uh, so much uh, confusion in that area. Now, at a more serious level of commenting is, as I said, uh, emotions are not like something in the brain, some module in the brain which we can copy and add to an artificial system. Okay. Em 
affective reaction, or as I prefer to say, I don't like too much to talk about emotions, motivation, let's call it that way, which to some extent is already built in as essentially needs to be built in reward learning, uh, which is one of the techniques that has improved the thing. I mean, it's not just like one thing. It's not like one little module over there. It's, uh, it's a way... Uh, it manifests itself at various levels from the, from the hormonal to the neurobiological to the physiological, etc., etc. So it's pretty complicated stuff. Uh, and um, when people talk about adding to, uh, adding to uh, uh, emotion to AI, they, talk, they, talk, they think it's better when the robot that lifts you out of your, out of your wheelchair, when you're going to be in your wheelchair sooner or later, that robot that lifts you out there, it should have a smiley face, fine with me, if you think that's a major achievement, but uh, that's just trivial, right? So, and actually, going, going back to the literature, we've done a review paper on that and we're working on an update of that review paper. It's absolutely not, not, not shown by the facts that it's better or worse that a robot has a human face, has a non-human face, has a human appearance, has a non-human appearance. This whole discussion in robotics about, about, a, about Uncanny Valley, it's, it's, it's not decided, it's not clear. So it, you, depending on what you read and what you, what you would like to believe, it works out differently. And depending on the circumstances it works, depending on the use of robotics, humanoid appearance or not makes a difference. And all the, those things are pretty, pretty, pretty uh, specific for a number of things. I'm sorry, I just, I, I want to just point out the political, like economic conditions that also produce a lot of these bodies of research and in a way there is a deep there is something deeply political about who gets studied who gets modeled and these things so that's and it doesn't have to result in ai but there, a lot of a lot of the presentations make general assumptions about human beings based on lots of different studies and it's for me it's of course i would just like to note that the, we don't all see things the same way i think it sort of follows on this perception but then those are defined by race, class, gender, geopolitical situations, and so on. And I just, I think it's important to bring that up. Yeah. That's absolutely clear that all those things are determined by gender, race, you name it. By, by time of the day, as I showed without explaining too much in one of, st one of, one of the studies I quoted, by, uh, by the state of your gut at a certain time, by the state of your visual system, etc., etc. And those do not directly translate into beliefs. I mean, we talk too easily about beliefs as this kind of stable su uh, superstructure that... Uh... Yeah, we see that there are lots more aspects that need to be discussed. Please keep discussing. I'm sorry we run out of time. Please uh, <laughs> um, ask the speakers face to face in the break. We now have time for 15 minutes break. We're going to start the third session on creativity and AI around 1 p.m. See you then. Thanks a lot again to Beatrice and Memo.
Pero también lo yo
Welcome to our third session of today on creativity and AI. Please take your seats. We're going to start now. Again, I should mention that uh, we have simultaneous interpreters sitting in the back. Yeah, <laughs> applause for them. I heard that the two of you have sub supported Ars Electronica uh, since or for decades already. Is that true? Nodding, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, um, the focus of uh, the next session is uh, creativity and AI, as already mentioned. Um, creativity has, or typically is defined as a kind of core competence of humankind. So, I'm uh, really interested in the talks we're going to hear now. Um, maybe we can ask for the future whether machines can be creative on their own or if machines uh, can help us at least to be more creative. Um, the first speaker in this session is Kenrick McDowell. Please come to stage, Kenrick. Um, he worked at the intersection of culture and technology for 20 years including collaborations with Nike, with Focus Features and HTC Innovation. And currently, uh, he leads the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program at Google Research, facilitating collaborations between Google's AI researchers, between artists and cultural institutions. And his talk will be on art and high-dimensional life. Thank you. So that, the, the talk will still touch on the theme of art in high dimensional life, but what I did um, was I deformed a presentation that um, I normally give because of some things that I feel very uh, strongly about presenting as soon as possible. So um, just, just wanted to let you guys know, what, know about that. Um, so, but the basic, uh, just the, the most important uh, basic information you need to know about me right now is that I lead this program at Google called Artists and Machine Intelligence. We're based in Google Research and we bring artists in to work with AI researchers and to develop projects that use AI. Um, I'm going to talk about some of those projects. Many of them are here at Ars Electronica, which is very exciting. And um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I've learned in the process of doing that. And so this is, these are the things that I really want to share with everyone here. Um, I feel very strongly that these need to be shared now. Um, and I'll, hopefully this will not seem too orthogonal to the um, rest of the presentation, but I'm going to kind of keep harping on this set of points. Um, and so this is a sort of logical structure that I've experienced as I've been working on these projects using artificial intelligence, um, specifically art projects. And the, this, this structure sort of starts with an observation and, and digs deeper into some of the underlying thinking behind the projects and, and some of the challenges that we face when we try to understand the impact that AI will have on uh, things like the city, things like the countryside, things like um, our social organization, which are areas of research that we also touch on in the program. And the basic insight here is that new tools generate new languages, and these new languages that they generate reveal new relations, new structural relations, new power relations that require new contracts of various kinds, new ways of understanding each other, new, power, new contracts between individuals, new contracts um, between individuals and society, new social contracts. And the underlying structure of any social contract is an ontology, ultimately. You know, maybe an ideology first, but ultimately an ontology. And the provocation that I'm going to be kind of harping on over and over in this uh, in this presentation is that we need to discover what that is in the 21st century as we enter into this world of intense complexity and multiple ongoing crises, whether they be extinction or climate or social justice. So um, with that, I'll sort of give you, start giving some real concrete examples and, and uh, expect to see this slide again. So 
we're talking about tools, right? AI is ultimately a technology, it's a tool, and in the context of my work and the work I do with artists and the work my team does with artists, we use that to make art. But let's go back to a very old tool, this hand axe, which is 300,000 years old. There is a researcher named Dietrich Stout at Emory University who's used MRI machines to observe the changes in people's brains when they are taught to make these stone tools in the way that were, they were made 300,000 years ago. This is what he says. The results of our imaging studies on stone tool making led us to propose that neural circuits, including the inferior frontal gyrus, underwent changes to adapt to the demands of paleolithic tool making and then were co-opted to support primitive forms of communication using gestures and perhaps vocalizations. The claim here being, or the implication being, that it was the making of these tools that resulted in neural changes that allowed for language to emerge. So what that means is that our tools change our brains and in that as they do, new cognitive faculties emerge, in this case language. Um, to talk a little bit about lens-based tools and image making or art history, we can take a look at this digitally reprojected image of the anamorphic skull in Hans Holbein the Younger's painting, The Ambassadors. It looks like that when it's not reprojected. Uh, it's pretty clear, based on some research that David Hockney has done, that the lenses were used in the production of these. It's basically impossible to do this without a lens. So that basic, that that makes this some kind of photograph, a hand-assisted photograph, but a photograph nonetheless. So within the history of photography, you can move from this type of work to the daguerreotype, to conceptual photography like Ronnie Horn's project, You Are the Weather, here, to projects like Mike Tyka's uh, Hallucinations of Facenet, which can be seen out here. What that process describes in terms of tools is the hand moving to the lens, moving to the CCD, uh, the, digital, the mechanism that allows digital cameras to work, moving to the big data archive, which is what is used in a neural net uh, training process. So the face net hallucinations that Mike Taika has produced that you can view out here are a sort of manifestation of the big data archive, and you can see a sort of expansion of photography from something that's done by the hand through something that's facilitated with the cloud infrastructure and ultimately neural nets. So the question, uh, you know, about cognition and, and what might emerge as a byproduct of this new tool, tools create modes of cognition that change neural structures. Representational tools are increasing in depth and complexity, the hand, the lens, the CCD, the big data archive, the neural net, and AI representations themselves are highly multidimensional. So what new language does AI art produce? This thought comes from uh, an intuition that I had from observing all of this AI art and working with artists that make it and understanding that there's a certain type of uh, mental model of multidimensionality that comes from understanding the mathematics behind these and engaging in the process of training neural nets. And so the original impetus for this lecture, Art and High Dimensional Life, was that this perception of multidimensionality could be a new type of language or cog mode of cognition that would emerge from using these tools and that I myself was kind of observing in everyday life after engaging over and over with these um, artworks. I'm trying to push that into the space of an ontological discussion that we might perhaps be able to use to develop some kind of consensus with which we can form new social contracts so that we can solve some of these wicked problems that are confronting us in terms of climate change and uh, extinction and social justice. Um, just as an aside, this is a 12-dimensional hypercube drawn by an outsider artist named Vince Rourke, who I met in Kansas City. Um, I bought this from him in 2003. He uh, got electroshock therapy for nerves and uh, nervous, tr nervous effects that were coming from smoking cessation and in the process started hallucinating these, um, these multidimensional structures. So this is just a sort of example of one way of perceiving multidimensionality. Um, this is another example. This is Trippy Squirrel. That was the sort of canonical leaked image on Reddit that kicked off the deep dream phenomenon. So um, we're talking about languages, right? And so there's this language of hallucination that has emerged as a trope or a method within AI art. As speaking of deep dream, you've probably seen this image before. Um, Memo did a really good job of explaining, hopefully you were in the previous lecture, um, so I won't 
harp on it too much, but um, this is a process whereby neural networks can be essentially run backwards to produce imagery that um, represents their internal state. That internal state is modeled in these neural net structures, so I had to turn this sideways to fit it on the slide because these are deep neural nets. Um, the depth comes from the stacking and layering of these structures. Neural nets have existed since the 90s, but it was only after GPU uh, advances in GPUs enabled their type of vector processing to be done on a large scale that they've become um, much more commonly employed in machine learning. The way these things are trained is by taking large data sets. Um, so you're looking at a sample of the ImageNet data set. ImageNet is what was used in some of the Deep Dream hallucinations. And these, this uh, training process, I don't know if Memo spoke about this, but the training process here is that you sort of show the neural net these images with labels, and you, you iterate um, a set of weights until the system can effectively recognize the labeled data. So that's a little bit of a technical explanation. I'll show you these videos so you can kind of see more clearly um, what I'm talking about. So this is going to show an illustration of how object recognition works in a neural net. So you, the, the, the recognition net has shown an image, various features. Um, are, re are recognized, and that results in the selection of a final category, in which this case is very generic. It says it's a bird. Um, so in, the, in this kind of new method of hallucination that I'm, we're talking about here, you simply run that process backwards and generate from the same features that are recognized in this iterative fashion, the way Memo described drawing what you see in a cloud and kind of retracing it over and over. So you end up with something that looks like a bird, but the way that it's perceived by a machine, not the type of bird that we recognize. Here are some examples of some of these categories. Um, these, these are hallucinations that illustrate categories of image recognition. Again, these don't look like what we think of when we see a, a, an ant or a measuring cup, but there are enough features within these images that um, they can be recognized as such by the machine. This is where the multidimensionality comes in. So in order to sort of understand how these neural net structures that look a little bit like this, how they actually work, what's actually happening mathematically, we can take the notion of linear separability and try to understand that. So if you look at the image on the far left, you can see there are, there are um, I'm sorry, if you look at the image in the middle, you can see that there are open circles and there are filled circles, right? And there's a red line that separates them. These are very easy to separate because they're, they're on two different sides of this, this square. And the formula for that circle, I'm sorry, the formula for the line that separates them is very simple. If, as in the case of the leftmost image, one of the dots migrates into the other cluster of open dots, one of the filled-in dots has moved into the cluster of open dots, in order to separate those with a line, we need a curve, which is a more complex mathematical structure. Uh, if, if we want to make it very easy to separate, then we can actually se separate them by moving them into three-dimensional space. Um, and separating them with a plane. And what you have with these neural nets is data that exists not in three dimensions, but in like upwards of you know, 500 or 500,000 dimensions that has been linearly separated by a hyperplane. So that's, a, again, more like technical mathematical jargon. But the point is that if we want to sort of separate uh, pieces that are clustered very tightly together in three-dimensional space and 500-dimensional space. It can be done, but it's done with this topological structure, which is measured and folded into these weights. And so you can see these, these uh, circles here are connected by lines, and each of those lines has a number. Those are weights. And so um, what those represent is actually a, a topology, which is a little bit like this or even like this. So I'm sorry to sort of like dump a lot of math here, but I think it's really important that we understand um, 
what we're experiencing because the sort of that because the new language that can emerge or the new cognitive faculty that can emerge from engaging with these structures has a lot to do with that and it has a lot to do with that multidimensionality. Um, so in the case of language, more specifically, we can, we can dial in um, actual linguistic examples of this hallucinatory technique um, using something called long short-term memories. This project, uh, this, is a, this is an image from a novel that was written by an AI attached to a car. Uh, the AI was created by Ross Goodwin, and the project is called Word Car. You can see a documentary about it in the AI room over here. Um, I'll read this out loud because the type is pretty small. But this is um, an image that was seen by a surveillance camera that uh, fed into this neural net. And what the neural net output at the moment, you know, this was March 27th at 5.44 in the afternoon. White clouds and blue sky spread out on the road. And in the storm, there was a silvery star-like streak of sleeping children. A pair of jeans were still on the table and the long black stains of hair shone in the cloud of flowers. So this feels um, a little bit Dadaistic or surrealistic. Here's an image of the surveillance camera. Here's the car. Uh, in this, we drove from New York to New Orleans, and uh, a lot of the trip was through an industrial corridor that was um, in the process of sort of decaying, let's say. Um, this project really, it gave an, it gave us an opportunity to think about and explore what machine perception really is right now, and the use of the surveillance camera, the other signals that came in to feed the AI, so the, uh, the GPS data, the time, uh, the Foursquare API, these were the senses of the machine, of the AI, as it was moving through this industrial corridor, as it was moving from New York to New Orleans. So the the what we, were, what we gave the machine to sort of perceive was largely conditioned by the needs of that corridor, which happened to be, you know, it was meeting the needs of people that are traveling. There's a lot of fast food restaurants. Um, it was largely about the freeway, red and white flags, and the stars were like a curtain of paper, like a broad stream of flowers. Um, another example where you can see a little bit more of the sort of limited scope of the machine perception here the Hard Rock Hotel in Casino Biloxi, a hotel in Biloxi, a high fisherman with a starry face and a stub of a coat on his face and his shirt looking boldly across his mouth. Um, I wrote about this in the Ars Electronica catalog. It's also available on our website, uh, the, the Medium blog for Artists and Machine Intelligence. Um, you know, the language that's being developed here is, is, as I was saying, largely conditioned by sort of the needs of a capitalistic, uh, you know, automobile-oriented, uh, geographically, you know, situated, geographically situated around a freeway, this type of situation. Um, and if you want to imagine, you know, artificial intelligence, if you, I don't think it's necessarily the most productive way to think about it, but a lot of people feel that it's helpful for them to think about AI as a sort of sentient, emergent intelligence. And if we were to think about it that way, I think it would be pretty important to imagine that, you know, what, it, what are its senses? And if the senses are, um, you know, largely conditioned by the needs uh, of um, food distribution, synthetic food distribution along the freeway, you know, essentially the needs of techno-capitalism, I think we need to be um, pretty pretty honest with ourselves about what kind of entity is emerging in that space and the language that it's speaking. Um, this was also, this project also tied in kind of uh, fairly deeply with uh, the notion of uh, um, an American literary road trip. So the precedents uh, that we, you know, considered as we worked on it were on the road, um, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. These were sort of references that the artist was bringing to it. So um, if you're interested in exploring that, please check out the essay. Um, again, this is, this is uh, an example of relation, new relations that emerge from working with this tool. So the tool is exposing sort of in, uh, structures within our, within our social system, structures within our economic system. Uh, but sometimes the relations that are mapped by these are not like such explicitly social relations. They can be, be literally formal relations, and that is the case in this piece by Rafiq Anadol, which you can also see here. This is some previous work he did at the Disney Concert Hall in LA. But the piece that I'm talking about is a piece we did with him um, 
that uses the archive of the Salt Museum in Istanbul. So we used machine learning to map uh, 1.7 million items of, of this archive into an immersive interactive uh, installation called Archive Dreaming, which you can experience here. Um, it's, a, it's a 360 projection mapped installation with moving images. You can interact with the archive. Um, and I want to show some slides that show the... Yeah, so this is sort of how the, the, the relational uh, element is surfaced. These, these lines illustrate features that are detected by the machine learning and mapped between the items in the archive so that when you experience the archive, you're moving through this three-dimensional space. And so this space is actually um, a much higher dimensional space that's been mapped down into three dimensions using something called T-stochastic neighbor embedding. There's an interface. This, in the original installation, there's a, there's a browsable interface. And so this is a way of um, working within the archive um, through a new mode of perception where this very large scale data set is kind of visualized all at once. And so you can see the, the structure of it, the underlying structure of the archive. Additionally, Mike Taika, uh, who collaborated with Rafiq, um, w used the neural net, the latent space of this neural net, to generate a um, series of hallucinations of content that could exist in the archive. So statistically or probabilistically or within the sort of multi-dimensional multi space of that archive, these things could exist, but they actually don't. And um, there's a mode within the presentation where you can view these. So I'm going to, oops, I'm going to quickly um, wrap up because I'm getting towards the end of the time here. But again, I want to express that the need, so as we move into these spaces of uh, using new tools, understanding the new languages that emerge from them, looking at the new relations that are implied by those languages or that already exist but are surfaced by those languages, we find ourselves with a need for new social contracts or new contracts of many different kinds. So, for example, um, looking at the way uh, individuals interact with these AI systems, we don't, have an, we don't have a bill of rights, we don't have a social contract that includes these type of automated decision-making processes. So, for example, um, crime prediction is uh, one of the more common use cases that we um, talk about when we want to uh, explain sort of emergent potential power relations or, or abuses of power or automation of abuses of power. Um, we can also talk about um, some. This this just came out today. There's someone developed a project that can that presume that presumes to uh, determine people's sexual preference by looking at their photographs um, with some degree of accuracy. And so when it comes to sort of how we're interpolated by power or how we are named by power, uh, there is a certain implication of these tools. And that, you know, I think this paradigm is actually a little bit, it's funny to apply these types of paradigms to a multidimensional space, right? And so I'll just quickly go through this study that my director, Blaise Aguadari Arcas, did around gender and identity. This is a self-reported um, questionnaire that has 65 questions. It took about two and a half minutes to complete it, focused on gender, sexuality, identity, and, and presentation. It was filled out by um, mechanical Turkers. And um, I'm not going to go into all the questions here because I'm a little bit running out of time. but. The important thing, I think, to surface is that when you look at the responses and when you map them in this 65-dimensional space, you end up with um, something that, can, that needs to be flattened down. And so how we do that, mathematically or linguistically, you know, currently um, we're kind of having a cu cultural conversation about doing that in a binaristic model, right? So if we, move, if we use something called singular value decomposition to sort of move it into a one or zero kind of space, you end up with a very strong binary representation of these features of uh, personal identification and personal expression of gender. But if you move, um, if you move, if you move into a spectral representation, you can start to see uh, that the peaks are still there, but you have more of a middle ground, right? You have a little bit more of a fluidity between those peaks. 
And if you move into a, th a three-dimensional representation that done with this Tisney technique, so taking a 65-dimensional space and flattening it down into three dimensions, um, you actually end up with something much more weird and blobby and hard to sort of verbalize with the existing language that we have. And so there's, again, this deformation of our existing um, contract about how we're interpolated by power, how our gender is expressed verbally when we start to look at it through this multidimensional model. And so the idea of high dimensionality within these systems or the notion that these high dimensionality within these, within these systems can, can deform our perceptions, our social contracts, and ultimately our ontology, um, I think is really the point that I'm trying to get across here. So I'm going to have to skip the very last bits here, but just I want to reiterate, we're working with new tools that force us or they generate within our discourse and within our work new languages, and these new languages reveal new relations, re relations to power, social relations, relations to the objects themselves, relations between the objects themselves, and those require new contracts, social contracts, um, contracts with com between individuals individuals and companies, contracts between individuals and society, and in order, to under, in order to form those contracts, because they really don't exist, you know, to use the gender example, we have a very binaristic way of contractually understanding that between each other. Uh, in order to get to a new working contract, we need a new ontology, and that ontology is, um, is up for grabs, but my, my very strongly felt conviction is that in order to solve the problems that we're facing, whether they're the um, the destruction of our infrastructure by these climate crises or by the rise of fascism or um, the mass extinction of the, of the animals that support us, uh, we need to tackle this ontological problem. Uh, and if we can't do that, we can at least try for the social contract. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenrick. Same procedure as before. Please take a seat for the moment. We're going to have a question and answer session again after the next talk, which will be given by Rebecca Fiebrink. She's a senior lecturer at Goldsmith University of London. She holds a PhD in computer science from Princeton University. Her research focuses on creative collaborations between humans and computers. And in this regard, she has worked with companies such as Microsoft Research or Sun Microsystems. She has also co-directed the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. And she's going to talk about machine learning as creative collaborative tool. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? Excellent. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to Ars Electronica for the invitation. Um, usually when I tell people I do work about machine learning um, in, and creativity, they think that I'm making machines that do all the creative work and kind of do all the fun stuff themselves. And actually, I'm not that interested in machines being creative. I'm not that interested in machines um, replacing human creators. Um, instead, I'm really interested in how machines, and machine learning in particular, can support human creativity and human expression. Um, and a lot of my research looks at how can we do this. I'll show you some software I've built to try to do this. Um, my research also considers what the consequences of this might be, both artistically and practically. Um, and of course, there's an element of this asking, you know, who, who should or who can use machine learning? Hopefully, it's not just people who are computer scientists. Um, so you could ask these questions in lots of different artistic domains. In a lot of my work, I focus on domains where people are using sensors to build new types of art or music or interactions, things like new musical instruments or new games. Um, and it's an exciting time to be working with sensors, as many of you know, as you've seen in many of the fantastic pieces outside this room. Uh, we have motion sensors like Connect or Leap. We have biosensors. Um, and these are giving us lots of rich information about what people are doing in the world or what's happening in the world. Um, we also have data that we all generate just as a, a fact of life in the digital age. Every time we interact with software or interact with our friends via social media, we can look at that as data that could potentially be used to artistic ends or used in self-reflection or other ways that are meaningful to us. Um, and there's a challenge here. One of the big challenges, if you've ever worked with this data, is that you know what, sensors and data can often be practically very challenging. 
Um, even if you're an expert programmer or an electrical engineer, um, you may be getting my, many dimensions of data. This data might be noisy. Um, it may be really hard to connect, say, um, even the accelerometers in your phone to an understanding of what is somebody doing in space if they're holding that object. And that's a really simple example. So in my work, um, one of the things I use machine learning to do is to help people build new interactions with sensors and with data, not by programming, but by giving examples. So for example, I could say I want to build a hand gesture controlled drum machine or a hand gesture controlled video game. Um, I can give examples of, hey, here's one hand position and I'd like the computer to recognize it as a closed fist and play a sound or make my ga game avatar do something. And here's another example of maybe an open hand, and I want a different sound or action. And this turns the interaction design problem into um, a supervised learning problem. Uh, now, supervised learning algorithms are a very specific type of machine learning, um, where algorithms are tools for building models. Now, the model is the thing that we ultimately care about or may care about, where we can give it a new input, say a new hand position, and get a new label, maybe open hand. And then we use that label to go do something, like play the right piece of music. Um, usually, as programmers, we make these models by hand. But if we use supervised learning instead, we can give a learning algorithm these examples, and it'll build the model for us. And hopefully, it'll do what we'd like it to do. So in 2008, I started making some software that would allow musicians and artists to engage in this process of using supervised learning for their own fairly arbitrary ends. Um, and I built a tool called Wekinator, which I'll demo for you in about a minute. And the first thing Wekinator allows you to do is build up a data set, expressing to the computer what you individually would like it to learn. Um, and then you can build this model using the algorithm and try it out. And if you like it, great, it's yours. If you don't like it, you can actually go back to the data and correct mistakes or make something more complicated and so on. And so if anybody here has taken a machine learning class or done machine learning in a more conventional context, you know that these kinds of interactions of giving people total freedom to create training examples, try out models in a messy um, sort of unstructured way, and then go back and tr change the data if they don't like what the model does, these aren't really allowed in most conventional contexts. Um, but for various reasons, they make sense here. Um, and there's a whole thread that I could talk about. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, but I'm going to skip over these questions about how developing machine learning systems for creative use might actually look a little bit different than how we use machine learning in other contexts. Um, instead of going on about that, I'm going to do a demo, and we're going to make some sound. And um, I'll give you two really quick examples. The first one. Um, is going to use my laptop webcam as an input, and I'm going to build you a really simple sort of dance classifier. And I'm going to use that to control a drum machine, which, all right, great, we have a drum machine. Um, and I'm going to stick machine learning in the middle of these two things using Wekinator. And I'm going to start, I don't have an example set. This doesn't require big data. That just doesn't require someone else in the world to be, you know, have really seriously collected information about what dancing looks like. We're just going to build it here on the fly. And we're going to build it to do something quite personal and um, casual. All right, so I'm going to start with some example creation. And I'm going to tell it when I'm standing here, you can see it's, you know, messy, but yeah, a suitable representation of me. Um, when I'm standing here, when it sees these inputs, I want it to make this sound. So I've given it some examples. And when I'm not standing here, I want it to make that sound. And I'm going to build that model and run it. And it seems to be working pretty well. It's learned what I've wanted it to learn. I can try to get it to make a mistake somewhere. All right, so this is still me. I still this, want this to be the first sound. So I'll give it some more examples and retrain it and rerun it. And it seems to still recognize that as me now. And that's not me. And I can keep doing this. I can add more things like my hand and say, here's a new sound. That should be the hand sound. And now I have a hand recognizer. So that's one way of using supervised learning. Um, musically, this is kind of fun to watch, but um, I could achieve the same kinds of sounds just by pressing a button. 
So um, the next demo I'm going to show you is something that you couldn't really achieve easily without machine learning. And so this is my favorite synthesis algorithm. This is called Blotar, and it's got lots of different control parameters. You can think of this as sort of nine virtual sliders that we can play around with to get Blotar to make some sound. So here's one sound, lots of other sounds. All right, so Blotar can make a lot of sounds. If I want to build a musical instrument that controls Blotar, um, I'm going to need to think about how I want to control those sounds over time using some sort of um, maybe gestural input. And here I'm going to use um, a leap motion, which is going to capture information about what my hand is doing in space. And again, we'll just put machine learning in the middle. Once my, my leap motion fires up, you'll see my hand on screen. And now I'm going to give it some examples of hand positions and sounds. So I might say, here's, here's a sound. And I want that sound to happen when my hand is right here. And let's pick a totally different sound. And I wanted that to be like the claw hand. And I can train and gradually move between the two things. And that's pretty fun. I can add more sounds to it, maybe. That sound, let's put that over here. OK, so you saw that that suddenly I'm manipulating these nine dimensions pretty naturally without thinking about them as nine dimensions. I'm getting the sounds that I in initially put into that design, but I'm getting totally different sounds as well. And if I like them, I you know, keep them there. If I don't like them, I can change my data to get my model to do something else instead. So that's a really quick demo of Wekinator. It is open source and free, and you can go download it. Um, let's go back to my slides. Um, so as I said, I don't just build software, I'm also a researcher, and I'm really interested in how this and other tools can support human creativity and expression. And so I'm, in the, the rest of my talk, going to talk about some highlights um, from my research over the last eight years or so. Um, so the first um, finding, really, is that, yes, this is useful for the kinds of things that I hoped it would be useful for. Um, it allows people to build some really cool things with sensors. And I'm going to show you some examples of work that other people have done, um, beginning with a um, video by a composer named Anne Heggie. And this is a, a piece that she made using um, input devices here, which are actually PlayStation golf game controllers. But she's got performers moving with them in quite unusual ways. So you can find the whole video on uh, Vimeo. As you saw here, the performers, um, she very consciously chose a set of movements for the performers that resembles a, a yoga sun salutation. Um, and she had specific ideas about how she wanted mu music to be played as people moved in this particular way. Um, another one of my favorite composers um, who I've worked with is named Letitia Tsunami. I'm not going to play you this video, but she's made a series of pieces for this instrument um, called Spring Spire, which is a totally new creation of, a, of springs stretched across a metal frame, and she plucks and scrapes and moves these springs around to play sound. Um, Wekinator has also been used by a number of people who aren't musicians, not making musical work. Um, one of my recent favorites uh, was just featured in Motherboard. An artist named Chino Kim made um, some glasses that 
um, will turn opaque any time there's a screen in your view. Right? So this is using machine learning to identify things that look like screens and turning off your vision when that happens. Um, another really cute project is um, by someone named Andreas Refsgaard, who um, made a little facial expression to meme um, controller. So no matter what kinds of facial expressions you're making, it'll match it with an internet meme for you. And he's got a really fun video showing how he trains the system. So I'll just play a little bit. Again, whole things online. The last example I want to show you is a student project from a workshop I taught last summer. Um, this was an undergraduate student, I believe, who um, made a little robot with um, an Arduino and a little motor and a leap motion. And this is what the robot does. So it just waves at you. It's called HiBot. And I like this, you know, because this is something that um, the student was able to make in a couple hours, including cutting out all the paper and, you know, attaching the motor and everything. This probably isn't something that you would spend five months building, um, but it is something that is great to be able to build in an afternoon. And people really respond to it. Every time I show this, people go, oh, so nice. So um, beyond just the fact that machine learning makes working with sensors easier. There are some really interesting and I think profound consequences um, for the artists who have started using this type of machine learning in their work. And one of the consequences is that it's just really fast to build things, but that doesn't mean that people spend less time building things. So if you look at literature in design or talk to people who are making things in any field, whether it's paintings or making computer software, um, they will talk about the importance of prototyping, of starting out with an idea and building an instantiation of that idea as quickly as possible to test it out. Because it's really hard to have an accurate idea of whether something works if all you're doing is thinking about it. Whereas if you're holding it or you're bringing it into the world, into a social situation, or doing whatever it is that you might ultimately want to do, you can reason about it more effectively. And then you change it. And you change it because it doesn't work how you thought you wanted it to work, or you change it because you realize your ideas could have been better and you improve your ideas. And so we can think, look at machine learning tools sometimes as tools for rapid prototyping, which just by making things faster can improve artistic outcomes. Another really important aspect of designing with Wekinator, designing by example, is that it changes the act of programming from something that's all about mathematical abstract representations to something that's about being in the world, right? If you think about you know, how you would teach an alien from another planet what it means to wave hello, you're not going to write down a mathematical formula talking about how your hand moves in three-dimensional space. You're just going to say, it's like this. And if the alien doesn't get it, you'll be like, no, it's actually, no, just watch me, I'll, I'll show you again. Um, and so we have all sorts of embodied practices that are important to us as artists. For instance, um, the way that a dancer moves, the way that a musician plays, or the way that they sound when they express a particular musical idea. Um, and then we have other things that we'd like to build, that we'd like to interact with ultimately in a similarly natural embodied way. And machine learning can take the design process for those artifacts and make it look like this. Right? Because when you're building HiBot, or you're testing HiBot, or you're debugging HiBot, this is also what you're doing, is you're waving to it. Um, so again, I've talked to people um, who've used Wekinator in more serious projects, professional projects, um, and they talk about the importance of feeling the thing that they're making as they make it. Another really exciting outcome for me is watching machine learning open up new kinds of creative roles for people who hadn't necessarily um, thought about taking on those roles or planned to take on those roles. Um, Leticia Tsunami, who I mentioned, who made the Spring Spire, talks about why she uses machine learning in her work and the way that it changes her role as the artist or instrument builder. And she talks about 
how, you know, for her, it's a political and an ethical and a creative decision to not want to feel like she's in an airplane cockpit when she's designing, where she just has this one great idea, and it's all about having the right buttons to make that idea happen. Um, she actually says, in a way, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You want it to be a little wild. You want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull. Um, and as you saw in the example that I gave with the leap motion and the, the funky sounds, I was adapting to it. I, I can't help but adapt to it as I move my hand around and notice, oh, that's a cool sound. I like that, or oh, I'm not sure I like that, but that's an interesting idea. Um, this is, I would argue, a little bit harder to do when you're building something by programming for various reasons. Um, the, last, the last thing I want to highlight, of course, is that nobody has to have a PhD in machine learning, nobody has to even be a programmer to use the tools that I demoed for you and make something effectively. I've worked with kids as young as eight years old, and with 20 minutes of a tutorial, they get it, they can build really cool stuff. Interaction design students can start prototyping with sensors and electronics much more quickly. They can do it on day one without necessarily learning the engineering stuff, and I think that's really powerful. Um, especially right now when we're in an age where most of the machine learning that happens in our lives is done to us, to the data that we generate. We have no say in how that happens, we have no control, we probably don't even know how our data is being used. I think it's really exciting to ask how we might give more people more tools to benefit from their own data. Right? Rather, that means making new musical instruments, might mean making accessible interfaces for people with disabilities, it might mean taking your data from your fitness devices or you know, other traces that you leave in the world and using that for self-reflection and so on. Um, so again, back to my motivating questions. How can machine learning support human creativity and expression? Hopefully I've given you some new ideas that are a useful counterpoint to this idea that machines, we just want machines to be creative and then we're not going to be left with anything to do. Um, and of course, this is something that I believe should be usable by as many people as possible. Um, I'm still doing research on this, but I'm also doing a lot more teaching on this. So if this is interesting to you, and you're an artist or musician or designer, or somebody who says, you know what, that might be cool in a project I have planned, I have a, a free MOOC that you can take um, with the free software that I showed you and lots of other stuff. And I'm really interested, in, again, as a researcher, how can we teach these things to people who aren't machine learning researchers, who never want to become machine learning researchers, but have really cool ideas um, and are going to make things that are just different from computer scientists. So um, that is the end of my talk, and I believe we are time for questions. Thank you very much for presenting such inspiring projects to us. Kenrick, would you join us on stage? I think before the lunch break we have time for uh, maybe two questions. We run a bit out of time, I'm sorry. Here's one. Where's the mic? Thank you. Uh, my question is to Rebecca Firmring. Um That was a great talk for both of you. I really enjoyed both talks. And, um, I'm trying to follow the um, literature on interactive machine learning, actually. I'm a researcher in machine learning, too. Um, my question is, I'm sorry if I missed, if there is a publication and if I missed it, but did you run any study about long-term interaction? Uh, yeah, so the question, did, did we run... Um, uh, there we go. Did we run any study about long-term interaction? I haven't done any really in-depth studies. I've done... I guess you could call them loose case studies where there are a few composers especially who've been using this software for about six years or more. Um, I haven't written an update to the, the original case studies that I published on some composers in 2011. But um, no, I think that's fascinating. And again, one of the really cool things about interactive machine learning that I talked about is that um, allowing people to iteratively change models um, gives people a space where they can express the fact that they've been changed by what they've learned about the models. And there is very much this interplay between the things that people learn about machine learning and about the design space that they're working in and the ways that they can or, or maybe can't use that knowledge to change what they build. And I think this, this is an interesting set of questions even outside the creative domain. Exactly. That's, uh... Okay. 
uh, exactly that's uh, what we know about musical instruments. And I was thinking the same. I, I was thinking if I have a model and as a musician, if I uh, practice that model, uh, what happens if I change it within time? Because we don't yeah. do that with musical instruments. I mean, we just, we just have a piano, we play it, we choose one, maybe we change it or not, but we don't have chance to change one key at a time. Yeah, so oh, there's some great questions there, and I'm happy to talk to you more about my, my views on that. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, there's another question in the back, the last question. Could you guys, um, I'm sure you saw it, could you guys think about IP? So, for like taking that car, taking that car example, who basically um, owns the art? Is it about the route you're taking? Is it about the idea to put the camera in a car that creates a book? Yeah, so, uh, in terms of how that's legally structured within the organization that I work for, for and with, um, the artist owns the IP in that case. So we don't, as Google or as Artists and Machine Intelligence, own the um, project or the IP. Um, there are some strict constraints around that in terms of um, what we can contribute, and in that case, like we can't contribute engineering specifically, but Ross Goodwin did all the engineering himself. Um, so yes, like on a very prosaic level, that's that's the answer. Um, but I think there are other questions that are you're sort of poking out there, in, in particular, um, the uh, question of IP with uh, training sets is a is a sort of unresolved one, you know. And so like in Ross's case, he uses all. Uh, Gutenberg project texts that are sort of open source, I guess you might say, or copyright free. Um, but if there's, there have been no legal precedents for somebody producing a you know derivative work that would be a neural net or or output from a neural net, which would maybe be the derivative work of a derivative work. So that's sort of in, we're in a new space there for sure. I fear we have to go into lunch break now. Are you staying here a little longer? Yes. So you're open for questions. Okay, great. Um, a big thank you to all the speakers that we had the opportunity to listen to today already. <laughs> big thank you to our interpreters again. <laughs> Please don't miss the next session starting at 3 p.m., which will be chaired by Yuri Krupek. Um, on the topics of um, ethics, philosophy, and spirituality of AI. So that's going to be really interesting again. And now enjoy your lunch break, enjoy Ars Electronica, and hope you're going to have lots of fun and new insights here in Linz. <laughs>